G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So before the video begins, I would like to give Raid Shadow Legends a huge shout out for sponsoring this video. Raid Shadow Legends is a brand new collection RPG game that is taking the mobile gaming landscape by storm. It provides an incredibly immersive experience, the best I've found on a smartphone in fact. It can only really be compared with the biggest PC and console titles, but the best thing about it is that the game is totally free. It has all the features that you'd expect from a brand new RPG title. Amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. More than 10 million players worldwide have already downloaded the game in less than 6 months too. In Raid, you have the ability to personally customize your champions, choosing their artifacts and creating a unique mastery build for each one of them. But what I love about this game too is that everyone can find something for themselves. Some love collecting characters, some are about the deep storyline and graphics, and I personally enjoy the PvP aspect of the game and the fact that there is always something new to do. I think that the game is amazing, but you don't just have to take my word for it. With over 300,000 reviews, Raid has almost a perfect score on the Play Store. The game is growing super fast and the highly anticipated new Faction Wars feature is now live, and there is a new awesome rewards program for new players. You can get a new daily login reward for the first 90 days in the game. You can also find me in the game under the nickname Be Buster. I tried Buster Nut, but it was taken. And if you're quick enough, you can also join my clan. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. This is my story about my haunted doll, Claire. She's been featured in the book Haunted Objects, Stories of Ghosts on Your Shelves, on a couple of paranormal podcasts, and the TV show Haunted Towns that aired on Destination America back in 2017. You can still catch reruns of the show on Travel Channel every now and then. So, as an eight-year-old child, I was given an old porcelain doll by a very dear family friend, Mrs. Marion. She came across things all the time and she was always giving them to me. And this doll was the last thing that she ever gave to me. I was never really into dolls at all growing up, but I took the doll and placed her in my room in a small child-sized rocking chair. The chair sat next to my closet dresser and right beside my nightlight. Now, the doll was really pretty. She was dressed in a peach and cream colored dress with an apron and petticoats. She had little Mary Jane shoes that, when removed, showed her delicately painted toenails. Her body was soft, only her head, forearms, hands and legs from the knee down were porcelain. Her lips were pink and her dark brown hair hung in slightly frizzed and now loose curls. Her eyes were brown and her cheeks were a rosy peach colour, all like mine. Mrs. Marion made a point of saying that the doll reminded her of me, which is why she gave her to me. From the moment that doll, Claire, came into my house, things began to happen. I was always uneasy with Claire. I never wanted to touch her, and when I played in my room, it was as if she watched me. It wasn't anything to panic about, but I just remember feeling like if I did something wrong, she might actually tell on me or something. <laughs> How ridiculous does that sound, right? Anyway. The first real occurrence I remember was when I was reading in my room, the ghost stories if you can believe that, when a musical carousel horse that sat on my dresser just began to play. But not just a couple of notes too, like old mechanical music boxes will do at times, but like someone just wound it up fully. I sat stunned and just stared at the little horse and it moved up and down in time with the music. And then it just stopped. Not wound down, but just suddenly stopped. I was a pretty brave kid. I didn't run and I didn't tell my mum. I used to see a shadow man in the hallway or in my parents' bedroom door all my years growing up, and if she didn't believe me about that, she wouldn't about anything as mundane as a music box playing on its own, right? And so I, I didn't tell my mum and I just let it go. 
but for several nights and into the years, I was awoken by what sounded like a, a woman inches from my face just shouting my name, Jill, wake up. I jump up and sit up and I just find my room empty. Those happenings died down after a few months and then she started to plague my little brother with the same thing and now that he and I are grown up and gone, she's actually moved on to my dad. The little thing started to get to me too. I'd put something in a certain place only to find it later on the floor or on my dresser right next to Claire. All my missing items eventually turned up around her too. At once, a, a ring ended up in the pocket of her apron, in fact. Books would fall off my shelves and a perfume smell would just sometimes fill my room. The doll itself didn't smell at all, but the air around her would. My catalyst to finally get Claire out of my room was the night that I woke up after hearing thumping around near my closet. I opened my eyes, sat up in bed, and of course my eyes were drawn to the nightlight where Claire sat. As I watched the source of the thumping became clear. The rocking chair that Claire occupied was rocking on its own. I had a thick shag carpet so there was no way that it was rocking just by chance. But if that wasn't enough, Claire's feet, which were both turned to the side facing opposite each other, slowly straightened themselves to be both pointing directly up. And this part still freaks me out 20 years later. She then turned her head, which was impossible to do since it was attached and fixed to her cloth body. She looked towards me and every music box in my room, four of them, started to just play at once. I was frozen with fear and I didn't feel endangered so much as I just felt scared of what was happening. I screamed for my mum and dad and the music stopped but Claire just maintained her gaze in my direction. And this is why I still hate dolls. Even after that, I, I couldn't get rid of Claire totally too. I ended up stuffing her in a box in the back of a storage closet. She's still there as far as I know. So is the woman who now screams my dad's name in the middle of the night. And no, and not in a kinky way. But while I think she explains some of the oddities that happen in my parents' house, I, I don't think that she's the tie to it all. Especially the shadow man. My friend Tim Wiesberg is a paranormal radio podcast host of the show Spooky South Coast and also an author. He asked me to lend him Claire once he heard my story back in 2011 and I obliged and Claire went to stay with him for a few months. He wrote about his experiences with Claire while she stayed with him in the book Haunted Objects that I mentioned earlier. Temperature changes in the room that she stayed in along with hearing voices were two of his noted encounters. Claire also stayed briefly at the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast in 2012. The guys from the Haunted Town show encountered some things in my parents' house while Claire was with them too. The guys from the Haunted Town show encountered some things in my parents' house while Claire was with them too. I used to do a lot of solo camping, all that sort of stuff when I was working for a uh, <laughs> a veggie grower in Humboldt County area of Northern California. I had probably several thousand hours in the woods by myself at that point. But being an East Coast guy though, I'm pretty paranoid. I always take my compound bow, uh, not to hunt but for you know, just in case you need it. I basically had no gun license at the time. That eve I set up a fire in a tent under a rocky outcropping. I took a smoke and was just chilling and at some point I just dozed off but it was awakened by something moving around on what sounded like two legs. I always have my shit set up for a quick bug out. If necessary I could leave my S bag and tent and be out in seconds. I laid there for a few minutes though just listening to whatever made a wide spiral around my campsite and gradually getting closer too. Before I sat up, I identified my bug out route and when the sounds were opposite the route, I grabbed my pack and bow and took off up towards the ridge line where I could get a better vantage point. I'm sure I was pretty loud so whoever was there definitely heard me. I get up top the steep incline at my back so I was reasonably sure that nothing could get me from behind and I lay flat to get eyes on where I'd just been. I lay there for several minutes and I could still see the light from the embers of my fire in the front of my tent. After a few minutes, I 
watched as something or a man or something on two feet walked through my camp between the tent and the fire. At that moment, I contemplated putting an arrow downrange to try and hit it, but as this thought went through my head, a 40 or 50 pound stone landed about 5 feet from my head. I can't explain it, but at the time, I, I felt like that that was a message. I felt like whatever tossed that stone was much bigger and stronger and faster and was letting me know that I didn't belong there. And if what or whoever this thing was wanted me dead, I would have been. And that obviously, there was more than one of them too. At that moment, I threw myself down that opposite slope and as fast as I could, headed for a ranger fire watchtower that I knew was some miles away. In my haste, I, I never actually found it. And long story short, the rest of the trip was pretty uneventful. Once I got home, I, I had a great story, and so I told a few people. And apparently, where I had been, some Native American friends said that the area was off limits. And I was apparently, definitely being told to leave. I don't know if I believe them, but allegedly, spirits of the previous occupants apparently roamed the night there. Anyway, that's my story, and I still don't know what to make of it, but... Take it as you will, I guess. This happened to me when I was around 15 years old, and I still have no idea why it happened or what it meant, but even now it impacts me as I'm 22 years old. So right next to my house growing up, there was a long gravel road that leads up to a cemetery on the hill. Right at the top of the hill, just before the cemetery, there was a house there. I spent a lot of time in this cemetery because I would walk or ride my bike up the gravel road and spend hours there just walking around or sitting under the trees and whatnot. But being so content with the wind and the silence, I just generally felt calm and safe there. But much of my family was buried there as well, so it was kind of comforting knowing that it was kind of my space. There were a few creepy things that happened every once in a while, but nothing too major and nothing too alarming or anything. There was a quick dart of a shadow behind a tree or a faint giggle or something, but I never felt threatened or scared or anything, even though I am a huge scaredy cat. But what happened on this one particular day, it uh, scarred me for the rest of my life. So one day, I jumped on my bike and began riding up towards the cemetery like any other day. When I began nearing the incline where the gravel road turned to pavement, and just before I could see the cemetery poke up, I saw smoke. It was strange, I thought. But I continued to ride and immediately saw that the entire hillside next to the cemetery, just outside of the fence surrounding it, the whole thing was on fire, engulfed, totally in flames. I raced over, dropped my bike and walked over to the fire and I could feel the heat from the flames. It was really hot and I could hear the crackling and the flames were low to the ground, almost as though they had become the grass itself. But my first thought was that they must have been brush burning or something and it had just gotten out of hand. In a panic, I jumped back on my bike and frantically began to ride back towards my house. After I had only gotten a few feet away, I looked back over my shoulder and there, standing among the fire, was a, a solid black figure. I could tell what he was wearing and he looked solid. He was wearing a, an old style brimmed hat and what I assume was a, a shirt with sleeves rolled up and suspenders and he was holding a scythe or something. An old scythe used to cut weed and such. I could also see the heat from the flames slightly distorting the figure in a, a heat haze. I felt like I couldn't breathe and I just kept checking over my shoulder and then forward to make sure that I didn't crash my bike and possibly get caught by whatever this thing was. As I sped past the house near the cemetery, the man who owned it, who was always nice to me, was sitting in his driveway with his mate. But he looked up at me, having a clear view of the scene behind me, mind you, and just smiled at me as though he didn't see anything. I looked at him sickly and then back over my shoulder, and the figure was still there seemingly moving towards me slowly now. Tears were running down my face now and I continued to check the figure until I was at the end of the hill and could no longer see it. 
I could still see the smoke rising in the sky though, and when I reached my house I threw my bike down and bolted into the house, falling onto the floor crying and unable to breathe. My parents looked at me confused as they ate dinner, and I tried to explain, but just ended up telling my mum to get in the car and come to the cemetery with me. Quickly, we got into the car and raced out of there, and I was terrified sitting in the back seat peeking out the window, and when we arrived, there was nothing. No figure, no fire, and not even any residual smoke or burn marks on the grass or anything. I got out of the car confused and walked slowly over to the grass where only minutes ago it had been totally in flames. I touched the grass and I started to cry again. I knew that my mum, or anyone for that matter, was not going to believe what I had just seen or experienced. I was scarred after that for a long time too. I couldn't sleep and I just never wanted to be alone, in fear that whatever that thing was would come after me. I still think about it from time to time and I've never seen or experienced anything like that again. My childhood was just uh, pretty much a train wreck. I had a, a lot of emotional and mental troubles, and looking back I can see that my family, they had similar issues. My mother was mentally abusive, and my father distanced himself from me, and I acquired anxiety and possibly depression I think. The school was going horribly, and I believe that this was all influenced by a malignant paranormal presence. Nobody wants to hear about my dysfunctional family, so I'll stick to the paranormal part, though. One thing that I should note, though, is that all of these things got better around the same time. The year I turned 15 and we moved locations. Nothing went back to normal, but my nightmares and panic attacks, they reduced in frequency, and my mother became less of a raging bitch, and my dad and I rebonded over our shared music interests, and other positive changes occurred after we moved. So, growing up in this house, I, I had terrible nightmares. The night terrors were the most common trigger of panic attacks too, and it made up, I would say, about 75% of them. I hated sleeping and would only get 3 or 4 hours per night, and sometimes even less. I'll briefly summarize ones that featured returning themes, as they may have some relevance to all this. Keep in mind that I was 11 to 14 years old at the time. So, the first one, I was in some sort of uh, strange limbo-esque place, a cookie cutter kind of houses that just went on forever and all seemingly abandoned. The sky was black, yet everything was illuminated plainly and I was with my cousin and there was a hooded figure walking a few yards behind us. We, uh, we paid no heed to it and came to a house that contained my family. Once inside though, my cousin was just violently and spontaneously dismembered. There was obvious panic and we all ran outside where we were all paralyzed and dismembered one by one by this hooded figure who had revealed himself to be a maggot infested corpse. As I was dismembered I woke in a panic and I had some kind of aversion to going into my parents room so I just kind of waited it out. I exhausted myself at some point and I just fell asleep again. The second nightmare that I had was my sister became pregnant and both her and her child died during childbirth. My parents took the miscarriage and treated it as if it were alive and they became so enthralled with the dead child that they no longer responded to outside stimuli despite my best efforts. And even though they were clearly alive, their bodies began to decay and rot. Strangely too, they all had the same decayed look as the corpse man from the last room. The third and final nightmare that I'll tell you guys about was I stood next to a pool with a, an unrecognized child next to me. He pointed towards the pool where a black robed figure just lay face down motionless. It had been there for a while and exuded just this really foul stench. The child jumped into the pool and sank to the bottom at which point I began to panic and I woke up. Anyway, you get the gist of it. There was lots of uh, decaying corpses and black robes and it was all just a returning theme. Now, on two separate occasions, I can recall shadowy figures appearing clearly in the real world. Once, as I awoke, a black figure just rushed unnaturally fast down the hall and into my room and behind my window curtain. 
I lay there, unwilling or unable to move for what felt like forever, just hoping my parents would come to save me. Finally, I, I leapt from my bunk bed and down the hall to the kitchen where my mother sat eating breakfast. What was really weird though was that I didn't hear her in the time that I was laying in bed, nor had I seen her enter the kitchen. We went to my bedroom to confront the figure, but of course there was nothing there. On the second occasion, I awoke to a figure standing in my doorway, and it nonchalantly walked down the hall into the kitchen, and I actually followed it, only to find that when I turned the corner, it disappeared. Every family member at the time reported seeing things out of the corner of their eye, too. Just the stereotypical stuff. A lamp shifting, stuff falling over. More notable ones were figures moving just out of sight, but these were much less common. My family seems to have wiped this entire time period from their memory and just refuses to talk about it now, aside from my sister that is. I haven't pushed to get any information out of them, but maybe, maybe I should try and talk to them. This incident occurred sometime in the fall of 2006. I grew up in a rural part of Ohio. My house had fairly dense woods located directly behind it, and as a child I had a passion for exploring, and I especially loved exploring those woods. It was my favourite place to be. But prior to the incident, I had wandered through those woods many times, always with my mother's permission. But there was one tree in particular that I frequently enjoyed to climb, it usually about to the halfway mark so that I could perch myself on one of the heavier branches and just relax as I listened to the peaceful sounds of nature. Climbing that tree for the first time was quite an accomplishment too. From that position, I could partially see the back of my house. So on that day, after a fair amount of exploring, I carefully scaled my favourite tree and I seated myself on a sturdy branch and took it in the view. Naturally, being late in October, the sun inevitably began to set within a few minutes. I always felt a little saddened to see the darkness approaching. The woods were like my own little sanctuary and I could entertain myself out there for just hours and when the darkness began to fall, my mother would stand at the edge of the woods and call my name until I obediently returned home so not to be stranded out there after dark. After watching the sunset until I could no longer see it, I began my descent down the tree. I was nearly at the bottom when I heard my mother's familiar voice calling my name. I thought nothing of it at first as this routine had occurred plenty of times before. But then, I realized something strange as my feet touched the ground. My mother's voice was coming from behind me, deeper in the woods, rather than towards the entrance where she always stood when she called me home. But my mum had never entered those woods before, at least not with me, and... I was eager to find her and show her all my favourite spots before it grew too dark. And that's when I realised that something was just off. I mean, how could she have gone into the woods ahead of me? But certainly, I, I wouldn't have missed her, but as I said, she, she never entered those woods too. She continued calling my name though, but there was something strange about it too. She sounded absolutely frantic, almost angry. And fearing that I was in trouble for reasons currently unknown, I, I froze in place. As her voice drew closer, I squinted my eyes to see if I could locate her and determine exactly how angry or upset she appeared to be, but I didn't see anyone or anything unusual. But suddenly, I, I heard her voice calling my name from the direction of my house, sounding much calmer this time. And seconds later, from somewhere within the woods yet again. It wasn't an echo too, and I wasn't imagining things. I was literally hearing her beckoning me from the edge of our backyard, as well as ahead of me. My legs just suddenly turned to jelly, and I couldn't quite comprehend what was going on. The voice that I originally believed to be her screamed from just ahead, Come here, right now. And I realized that whoever or whatever was mimicking my mother was drawing closer now. I didn't question which voice was actually my mother's as there was something about the way it sounded that really unnerved me. Terrified of what I would see if I stood there much longer, I, I just turned around and ran towards the exit of the woods as quickly as my legs could possibly carry me. It was honestly amazing that I didn't trip over anything in my haste. Even though my house wasn't very far away from where I'd been standing, those woods had never seemed larger to me than they did in that moment. From behind me, 
my mother's voice continued to call my name, now sounding really desperate too. Panic set in as my actual mother finally came into view, waiting patiently as she usually did until I returned home. In my frightened state, I absolutely refused to look back. And as soon as I was out of those woods and in the backyard next to my mother, the other voice was just suddenly gone. Rather than fading away, it, it just seemed to stop the very moment I stepped foot into my backyard. I, I must have looked as frightened as I felt because my mother asked me what was wrong. Slowly but surely, my panic subsided, but I didn't say anything until we were safely inside of the house with our doors locked. I asked my mother if she had entered the woods, and appearing confused by the question, she told me that of course she had it. With that confirmation, I hesitantly asked her if she had heard anyone else calling my name and yelling, and the answer to that question was also no. Although I was still very much shaken up, I... I managed to explain everything that happened as clearly and rationally as possible. My mother was surprisingly nonchalant about the whole situation, explaining that I must have imagined it, that I was spending too much time out there by myself. The incident in those woods has just stayed with me to this day. I can still hear the voice as clear as a bell, and whoever or whatever it was calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, but I just knew somehow that it wasn't her. Not only was she waiting for me outside, but the voice also sounded strange in a way that I still can't fully explain. I didn't go back into those woods until I was 17 years old, and even then I, I never hung out there for very long. I've carefully gone over every possible explanation, but none of them seem entirely plausible. It certainly wasn't my mother playing a prank too. There was just no way that she could have pulled that off. Not to mention the fact that she's never been one to play pranks. I also highly doubt that it was anyone else because, as I stated before, we lived in a really rural area. The closest neighbor was at least a mile away and I wasn't personally acquainted with many of them. So how could they have known my name and where to find me? We've since moved out of that house but my mother and I occasionally discuss the incident. She still claims that she never heard or saw anything unusual out there, and I know I probably shouldn't, but what happened in those woods, it continues to bother me. I spent many hours there prior to that day and never had anything out of the ordinary occur. The best explanation I have at this point is probably a doppelganger or possibly a demon, but I'm really unsure. If anyone has a possible explanation as to what might have happened, I'd love to hear it. Anyway, thanks for listening. When I was about eight years old, my brother who was eight at the time and cousin who was nine all stayed with my grandparents one night. My cousin lives at the other end of the country and we didn't see him very often and has some kind of uh, social difficulties. He's awkward and uh, it's never been diagnosed and was very needy compared to me and my brother. We were all staying in my grandmother's spare room which had two twin beds which my bro and cousin slept in at one end of the rectangular shaped room and I was on the air mattress at the other end of the bedroom which was directly opposite the bedroom door. My cousin got up whining that he was scared of the dark and my grandma came upstairs and told him to go back to bed. She left the landing light on and the door half open and we went back to bed. I remember being able to hear the TV downstairs and my cousin was restless. I was awake, but I just tried to sleep. Not long later, and I remember because I was still awake, although starting to drop off, I saw through the very dimly lit bedroom what I can only describe as a, a goblin or a dwarf of about two foot in height. Smack the end of my cousin's bed, and I saw the silhouette of it run out of the room. It didn't move the door, it just sort of maneuvered through the opening. I remember hearing its footsteps as it ran out, and... I absolutely froze and I just laid there, uncertain of what I saw for a minute. My heart was racing and my feet and palms were sweating, but I just froze. Seconds later, to my horror, my cousin got up and put on the light, walked downstairs to see my grandma, complaining that something had banged on his bed. The whole time, I, I just laid on the air mattress not wanting to believe what I just saw, and my cousin whining just confirmed it. My grandma came up and told him to stop being silly and to just go to sleep and I didn't say a word but I know 
what I saw. 20 years later, and I can still remember the whole thing. My brother was fast asleep throughout, and my grandma still lives in that house now, and I had some night terrors in that house when I was little, but other than that, I, I don't find anything particularly supernatural about it. I've never experienced anything like it before or since then. I spoke about it with a friend years later, and they said maybe it was a, a house demon or something. I just really don't know. So for context, I'm a 25 year old female from the UK but this story takes place back when I was about 12 years old. I guess it starts with us uh, moving into a new house, but the house, it wasn't your uh, stereotypical creepy house. It wasn't that old and was fairly modern but it didn't take long before we started to feel that the place was just a bit off. It started out pretty tame, like the feeling of just constantly being watched and stuff like that. But it wasn't long before it escalated. But to be honest, a lot of weird stuff happened in this house, but I'll talk about the three worst experiences. So, the house had been extended at some point. A couple of rooms were added to the side of the house. This upstairs extension room belonged to my dad and his girlfriend, and they also had an ensuite. The strange or stupid thing is though is that when this extension was built they didn't extend the loft space so we had the original loft over the old part of the house but the part above my dad's room was bricked off so there was just this empty space that you physically couldn't access. Anyway one evening my dad and his girlfriend are just laying on the bed having a cuddle or so I'm told when clear as anything they heard stomping footsteps directly above them in the blocked off loft space. There was like four or five loud steps and then a, a kind of scuffle followed by a huge bang and the sound of a person making an ah noise as though the person had tripped and fallen or something. And after that, it was dead quiet but it's not like they can have a look and see if anything was up there, right? So, my dad's girlfriend was freaking out pretty bad at this point and threatening to move back with her parents. So, the next one is uh, kind of hard to explain as the layout of the house is relevant, so I hope this makes sense. So downstairs in the hallway, we, we had this thick glass vase that my dad filled with glass pebbles and attached it to the wall. I want to point out that it was very safely attached. Obviously, as he had kids in the house, he had made sure that this thing was well and truly secure on the wall. On the night that this takes place, luckily, I wasn't home. I was either staying at a friend's house or at my mum's, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, it's like 3am and dad and my stepmom are asleep until they're woken up by a massive smash. They open their bedroom door and see shards of glass just everywhere. So, they get some shoes on and go to investigate. And it becomes clear that our lovely decoration had been ripped out of the wall and then smashed like actually ripped out like the screws were still in the bracket that held the vase and they were huge long screws on top of that though shards of glass are just everywhere literally every room in the house and sure when you smash something glass does seem to end up in crazy places but this this was something else there were just handfuls of large shards in my bedroom and in order to get from the hallway to my bedroom you had to go up the twisted staircase, turn right at the top, go like 5-6 feet down the landing and turn right again. So somehow, all this glass had managed to travel upstairs about 12 feet and around two 90 degree corners. And that is just impossible. The last incident, and certainly not the least, it was in my dad's room and ensuite. So, my dad had a lock on his bedroom door, and he didn't actually put it there, it was just there when we moved in. He didn't use it at first, but then my brother started bringing loads of his friends to the house at lunch times, and soon my dad started to notice money going missing from his room, so he started to lock the bedroom door when he left in the morning. This had been the routine for a little while too, when one day, my dad comes home from work, unlocks his bedroom, opens the door, and finds a load of blood on his bedroom carpet. Obviously, he's like, what the F? And investigates further, and there's even more blood. 
it's like a trail from the bedroom door, across the room and into the ensuite and into the bathroom, and there's more on the carpet and also loads just smeared on the counters, sink and toilet and just everywhere. Dad is obviously freaking out a bit, but tries to find a reasonable explanation. I mean, did his girlfriend come home at lunch and have some kind of accident or something? No. Had me or my brother managed to get the door unlocked while Dad was at work? No. He even started to think that maybe the cat had snuck in an injured animal or something in the day before or something, so he was searching all over for a small bird or a rodent, but there was nothing. And we never did solve the mystery of the blood or the glass or the person in the roof for that matter. Anyway, I think we lived in that house for about 18 months in total, but the revelation came about a month or so after we moved in. Dad's outside and gets chatting to a neighbor and after a while she says something along the lines of, so have you met your new friend yet? At this point, I don't think any of the real crazy stuff has happened, but we had already picked up on the weird vibe of the house. So, Dad asks her to explain, and it turns out a few years back, a, a teenage guy had died in the house. I believe it was leukemia, and he'd been unwell for a long time, and they made the decision to just bring him home to die. And so, his parents moved out not long after, and since then... Nobody had lasted more than six months in the house. Also, a couple of extra just random fun freaky facts about this place is that when we decorated my brother's room, we stripped the wallpaper to find the guy had left a message under the paper. Nothing ominous, but it was just like Bob Joe was here, 2001 or something, but it was still kind of freaky as we knew who he was at this point. We also found out from a neighbor that this family converted the living room for him when they brought him home, so he actually died in a very specific spot in the living room. The exact same spot where we put our snooker table, which me and my friends often made into a den and slept underneath. About four years after we moved out too, one of my friends from school moved in and we weren't hugely close, but he knew that I used to live there and that I had some weird stories about the place. But his parents were non-believers and so weren't too bothered, and it turns out that in between me moving out and him moving in, somebody had actually blessed the place, or whatever it's called, and it seemed to stop the crazy stuff. But my friend is still adamant that the house just doesn't feel right, and he often feels on edge, but luckily they haven't had any weird experiences. And so, that's my story. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh... I'm sorry if it was a little bit long. When I was little, about seven or eight I'd say, my mum and stepdad used to take me with them to visit a friend. The adults hung out in this guy's garage and I had to play with the other kids outside. The only time that we went into the actual house is if someone had to go to the bathroom. I would never go in there by myself because I always wanted my mum to go with me. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs and the house was kind of old and I remember it being really fun because there was one of those, uh, those stair lift chairs and sometimes we got to ride it up to the bathroom. The chair belonged to the guy's mother who actually lived there with him. She was really old with more white hair and she always sat on the sofa in the living room across from the bottom of the stairs watching TV and she never spoke or looked at you when you came in and I always assumed that she was just deaf or senile. A couple of years ago I was talking to my mum about this guy's house and how creeped out I was to go in there alone. I told my mum and there was always that old lady sitting there in the living room and she never looked at us and it was really creepy. My mum got this wide-eyed look and said, What old lady? Apparently, the guy's mother had died a few years ago before we even started going over there. But I know that I saw her every single time too. And I can tell you every detail of what she looked like, down to her clothing and the brown crochet afghan that she always wore around her shoulders. And my mum and I were both pretty freaked out by this. Along these lines too, she told me a story that day of how once she was in the bathroom at the top of the stairs in that same house and she heard someone come up the stairs and jiggle the doorknob to the bathroom. She yelled out just a minute and then she looked out the window to her left to the toilet and saw that 
everyone that was there, standing around outside in the yard, was everyone who was at the party. She zipped up super fast and yanked open the door and there was no one there. I'd love to go back to that house as an adult, but sadly the guy who lived there moved away and we don't know the people who live there now, so I guess that this is uh, all the information that I'll ever get. So I was about 15-ish at the time and lived in East Tennessee, and I still do, but I digress. I absolutely loved walking in those woods as all of the fallen trees and the brier patches and the mud holes just made a fun little obstacle course of sorts. Another thing that will be important later is that I also have a deep interest in the paranormal and occult and things of that nature, they never really freaked me out too much. So I had started off into the woods that day just sort of for a short walkabout. But this time though, I decided to go just a little bit farther than I usually did and in my house had just left my line of sight when I found something odd. And that something was an area of the forest in which absolutely nothing was growing. There weren't any trees or moss or grass or mushrooms or anything. This area happened to be in the shape of a large oval too and I couldn't see any imperfections in its shape. There weren't any signs that it was man-made either, so naturally I just sort of stood there and marveled at the strange plot of land. But shortly after, things started to get a little bit weird. I started hearing some unnatural noise and it sounded like it was coming from everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. I could hear it right in my ears and from the forest around me and it was getting louder too. It took me a minute to identify the sound, but... It sounded like it was a, a group of women harmonizing. At least that's what it sounded like to me. Now, by this point, I was kind of a little bit excited to be honest, and I was and still am in love with the paranormal, and whatever was happening was obviously not a natural occurrence. I wanted to stay and observe, but I guess whatever or whoever was there was telling me to leave. The harmonizing soon filled my ears too, and was actually beginning to be painfully loud. In spite of this, I, I stayed adamant about staying there, but then came the weirdest part. I just got really scared all of a sudden and bolted back in the direction of my house without warning. I tore through briars and mud, not even trying to slip past them until I just found myself in my backyard again. As I stood there, covered in scrapes and mud and trickled with blood, I, I realized that I wasn't actually the one that was moving my body. It was... Almost like I was in complete autopilot or something. I mean, I knew very well what I was doing, but I wasn't the one telling my body to do it. I don't know, it's, it's really difficult to describe. But being my hard-headed self, I actually tried to find the spot again, even though I was legitimately scared by that happening. But no matter how many times I looked through those woods, I never found that place again. This happened last week and it was about 11pm and my city has been in the midst of a huge water storm with heaps of rain and cold nights. Just as I'm getting ready for bed, my wife tells me that her minivan needs gas and being the awesome husband that I am, I tell her that I'll get dressed and take her van to the gas station so that she doesn't have to first thing in the morning and in the rain and whatnot. The streets are pretty empty and I don't go to the nearest station to my house but to one further away because it's cheaper. There is a steady rain and some streets are dark and as I pull off from the main road onto a side road that will eventually lead to the other main road where the station is, I stop at the light. I just happen to look over at the right hand side of the street and there's a storm drain there and water is flowing pretty good down the drain and this part of the street isn't too dark as the light from the intersection illuminated this area. Now, just as I'm looking, I... I see a, like a, a black figure crawl to the storm drain and at first I think it's some kind of debris as it's approaching the drain but as I look and it gets closer I can see that it has legs, a head, a torso and arms too. It proceeds to crawl into the storm drain and with its arms it lowers itself down holding onto the curb and then just jumps in. 
I was like, what the hell is that? It looked bigger than a dog, but smaller than a child, I think. If I had to describe what I saw, I would say it kind of looked like a monkey or, or something like that. Maybe a fast-moving sloth. Whatever the case, it was definitely humanoid and it was weird. Also, I, I definitely wasn't half asleep or drunk and I know I didn't imagine it. I also don't live in an area with lots of wildlife. But just the occasional skunk or possum and coyote and that's pretty much it. Either way... Why would any animal just jump into a storm drain with a good amount of water flowing into it? It was weird, and it looked like a person, but a tiny person, and uh, I don't know what to think. So, it was last Sunday night, during the blood moon and lunar eclipse, that my friend and I decided to drive up this mountain that's about um, 40-ish minutes outside of my town. We live in northwest Washington, right by the border, in some rural communities. This mountain borders a Native American reservation as well, which I'll get into later, and is now used for logging and has public access to trails and all that. So... Now, my friend had been to this mountain about a year before, and he swears that he saw something in the trees that looked sort of like a man, but way off, and it disappeared before I could have another look. So, going to this mountain, I was already thinking to myself, oh great, I bet we're going to come across some sort of Bigfoot shit or whatever. But I'm stoked for the great view, so it wasn't really a big deal. But we reach this mountain and begin making our way up, and I immediately just feel really uneasy, but I couldn't really put my finger on it. We probably spend a good hour driving to the top because we keep getting lost on side roads for small amounts of time, and I'm just not getting good vibes at all at this point. There was one spot in particular too that just made my skin crawl. Normally when I get a bad vibe, I can kind of like feel around. I don't know if that makes sense, and I kind of get a sense of where it's coming from, but this time I... I just couldn't pinpoint it. Everything around me was just giving me this really off feeling. But we reached the top and have to turn around because our dumb asses didn't realize that they closed the top viewpoint for the night and blocked the road with a gate, which in hindsight we're actually both very grateful for now. On the way down, I, I noticed that my friend is visibly on edge too, and he didn't believe in the paranormal at all and thought that I was full of crap when I would tell him about my experiences. We both just wanted to get the hell off that mountain though and we keep seeing stuff moving in the trees but couldn't determine if it was just shadows playing tricks or not. It very well could have been, mind you. When we're a good portion of the way down, we stopped the car for a split second because there was a pretty view just from the road and we at least wanted to see some sort of view since the top was closed. So we stop and we both hear this noise that's unlike anything that I've ever heard. It did not sound like any animal and I spent the whole next day listening to various animal noises to try and compare and nothing at all came close. It sounded really aggressive and almost metallic and it came from directly behind the car. A side note too, whenever I've had an experience where I'm positive that I've encountered something... My eyes start to water and I sort of just cry and the instant that I heard this sound, my eyes started filling with tears so I already knew that something sketchy was up. We both just look at each other though and we can just feel this thing. I've never felt just so much evil and hate in my life. It felt like it was directly behind us and it just felt really big and really pissed at us too. To be quite honest too, I've I've never been so full of just absolute terror. So my friend screams and he just floors it and I instantly shine my phone light into the back seat because I felt like whatever was there was right in the car with us and I remember saying what the hell was that as he's flooring it and he said I don't know but I don't want to hear that ever again. So I'm basically sobbing as we're hauling ass down that mountain and I'm trying to calm us down by talking about my history class or just anything and we finally reach the road and get our asses home and I remember him turning to me and saying, I know exactly what you've been talking about now. Now, my friend is the biggest skeptic and even he 
absolutely could not explain what he heard and felt. We get back to his place though and we're flipping our shit and he starts to look into that mountain and the tribe that lives next to it and I begin to wonder if his experience the year before had anything to do with it. And he immediately finds native folklore from the local tribes that have to do with these creatures called stick Indians, which are malevolent forest or mountain spirits that sort of resemble what we think of as Bigfoot. But they lead lost travelers astray with eerie noises and clicking and whistles and whatnot. I'm not extremely educated on this topic though, so any further information or ideas would be appreciated. Anyway, he's convinced that that's what we've encountered, which definitely fits everything we experienced on that mountain. I also found a local post from a few years ago about skinwalkers that detailed an experience very similar to ours on that same mountain. Now, let me just say that I have no clue what we encountered, so this is all just speculation. I just know how scared I was and, and normally when I have an experience, I kind of freak out for a minute or two and then I'm fine and think it's actually pretty cool. But this time around, I have wanted absolutely nothing to do with it again. I'm actually still pretty terrified and have trouble falling asleep because all I can do is think about what happened. Whatever we both felt was just extremely negative and really aggressive. Now, to the skeptics out there, we definitely potentially could both be idiots and nothing supernatural at all occurred, but I don't know about this one. The fear that we felt was more than just being spooked out by something. It was full on fight or flight mode and I was completely overwhelmed with the feeling from that thing and I never ever want to feel that again and especially never go back to that mountain again. Even my friend is having trouble with it too and... Like I said, he's the biggest skeptic I know. Anyway, do any of you guys have any thoughts or are we just being idiots? Or did we encounter a stick Indian or something else? The stick Indian theory does make the most sense to me as we were on historical native land and maybe it was angry because of its home being logged and just wanted us out of there or something. Also, maybe the blood moon and the eclipse caused a spike in supernatural activity or something. I don't know what it was, and sorry for such a long and twisty post, but I'm also trying to make sense of this as I write it. Any thoughts or opinions or similar experiences would really be very much appreciated. When I was younger, a group of friends and I were longboarding around a nature park near my house. This nature park had a lake that was bordered by a walkway on one side, with lights uh, maybe every 50 feet or so I'd say. But we were standing maybe two or three lights from the end, throwing bread into the water for the ducks when we decided to leave. So we start kicking and I'm at the back of the line when I turn around and notice standing in the beam of the last light, uh, maybe 40 or 50 feet away, is what looks like a woman in a, a white gown with black hair walking towards us. She had her arms crossed as if she was cold and I watched her for maybe four or five seconds when she looked up at us and then set off towards us at a dead sprint. We start laughing thinking that someone's just messing with us but we started kicking pretty hard. Now it's important to note that when you're kicking hard on a longboard going downhill you can easily cruise at about 15 to 20 miles per hour. So we're all laughing or whatever when I turn around again and this woman is catching up to us. We had never seen someone run that fast for that long and we all panicked a bit and began kicking as hard as we could. We were easily at 20 to 25 miles per hour at this point and as we hit the last light I, I dared to turn my head again to notice that this woman was only about 15 feet behind us now and her features were really exaggerated. Her arms were just way too long and her hands were huge and her fingers looked like they had extra joints in them or something. I couldn't see any detail in her face too but she was soundlessly keeping pace with my friends and I. The nature park had what we called the boardwalk that connected it to the nearby subdivision of neighborhoods where I lived and we were kicking as hard as we could for it. She was maybe five feet behind me when we hit the wood of the boardwalk and as soon as we did she just stopped dead in her tracks like instantly just stopped. No sound, no panting, nothing. 
We went maybe 50 feet down before we stopped and watched this thing, and she stood there for a minute, and then she turned and walked into the tree line of the nearby woods. But then, she squatted behind a tree and poked her head out, watching us. Needless to say, we promptly got the hell out of there. My friends and I, we've only talked about this once. And my buddy who was at the front of the line of the friends who was kicking, he was kicking so hard to get away that he actually tore a hole in his shoe. If any of you guys have any idea of what could have pursued us that night, I sure would love to hear it. So I used to do some house cleaning for a young couple that I knew and the husband worked out of town and they had three really young kids. I generally come in once a month or so whenever the place got really bad. Now, the woman had mentioned beforehand that there were some, uh, some paranormal events going on in the house. She didn't tell me what they were exactly because she also wanted me to come in at some point and do a clearing on the house. Yes, I clean houses but also do clearings. She was hoping to get some confirmation on what she and her family were picking up on, but the first time I cleaned for them, I did a walkthrough and felt nothing until I got down to the basement level. But there was a family room down there and also a bedroom with an ensuite bathroom. Her five-year-old slept in this room and made an absolute nightmare of a mess in that bathroom with toothpaste and crayons just all over the walls and wet toilet paper all over the floor. Anyway... I could feel something in the bathroom just kind of watching me. It didn't feel malevolent in any way, but just sort of watchful, and I kind of felt watched in the family room too, but it didn't feel like the other room, and again, it was just watchful. Other than that too, the house felt fine, and totally clear and very positive. But the woman confirmed that her daughter always saw a, a black man standing in her bathroom too, so... That was confirmation for them. The woman had seen a man on a horseback in the living room once too. The house was actually less than 10 years old and the whole area had once been farmland. Now, one day, the woman took her kids out of town for the long weekend but wanted me to do some cleaning. She hid her house keys in the kids' wagon in the front yard and she asked me to be careful to put the keys back in the wagon as this was the only set that she had. I came in, cleaned both the lower levels, then started in upstairs in the master bedroom. I was in the process of cleaning the ensuite bathroom when I heard people talking down in the main entrance. The area was tiled with a big set of stairs going up to the bedroom, so their voices carried and were actually quite loud. I 100% believed that it was relatives of the woman at the time and I could hear them talking about her. They mentioned her name and said that she was out of town and... It sounded like one woman and two men. But one of the men sounded very elderly too, so I was thinking her parents and her grandfather came over or something. The woman was the loudest and seemed in charge, and I heard them talk about me, and the woman said, oh, she's cleaning the house for Sarah. I also heard her say something about the house keys, and I had actually put them beside my purse on a little shelf by the front door at this point. I felt very self-conscious being upstairs while they were standing there talking about me, so I took my gloves off and I went downstairs to introduce myself. But when I got downstairs, there was no one there. I hadn't heard the door close or anything, nor had I heard it open to begin with. But the door was locked too, and the crazy thing was that there should have been melting snow and just kind of crud on the floors. It was winter, and three people coming into a house and standing in the front entrance would have left some sort of puddle on the floor. I was kind of amazed and actually pretty excited about the whole thing, and I wasn't frightened in the least bit. But they felt very parental and kind of protective of the family, and I was excited to tell my client what I had experienced. And so I went back upstairs and finished cleaning. When I went to leave, though, the keys, they were gone. Now, I know for certain that I had left them on the shelf by the purse. In fact, whoever was downstairs sounded like they had seen them too since they mentioned them. And I ended up spending an extra hour and 45 minutes looking for those damn keys. I called out to the ghosts and begged the ghosts and got mad at the ghosts, tried to bargain with them, but it was all to no avail. 
I didn't have my client's cell phone number and only her landline too, and the lock was a deadbolt, so I couldn't lock it without the keys, and the back door was also a deadbolt. I had no numbers for any relatives, and I was beginning to envision having to spend the entire weekend staying in that house alone. At this point, I was kind of beginning to feel scared, not wanting to sleep there. And I don't know if it's just me or, or what, but it kind of felt like maybe they wanted me to stay there or something. I searched everywhere though, and all three levels, under couch cushions, in the kitchen drawers and cupboards, uh, the kids' bedrooms, where the toys were and everything. I did a thorough check of the basement and the bathroom, and even looked outside where the keys had originally been, and I was about to give up when I thought that I'd recheck the basket on the kitchen counter, and it had bread and buns in it, and at the bottom of the basket, there were some old flyers, and the keys were sitting neatly on top of those flyers, under the bread. At this point, I had chills running down my spine, because there was just no way that I could have missed them the first time. I mean, the keychain had a huge gummy flip-flop thing on it, and a mini Tupperware container on it too, and you just couldn't miss it. Needless to say, I got the hell out of there and locked the door behind me, so relieved not to have to stay there. When I told the woman after she got back, she said that they often had important things go missing, her husband too, and it was more than her. She also said that her husband had heard people talking before, but she hadn't. I still don't know what happened that day, but when the thought crossed my mind that maybe whoever was there wanted me to stay there, I don't know what it was, but I just kind of got this feeling like maybe they were trying to trap me in that house or something. So, I'm extremely skeptical about the paranormal, but this experience kind of blew my mind, so I thought I'd share it. So, I used to live in a building that had eight separate flats in it. I didn't interact much with the other people in the building, except for the guy who lived next door to me, one of the nicest guys I've ever met, and also the guy who lived directly below me. I immediately noticed when I moved in that the guy below me was the opposite of a considerate neighbor. He blasted music at all hours of the night, sometimes for 24 hours straight too, and honestly though, I, I could sleep through a hurricane and it genuinely didn't bother me that much, except for the fact that it was just super rude. Anyway, I, I opted to keep the peace and not mention it. The guy who lived next door to me, Gary, approached me one day asking if I was okay about the guy below me playing the music so loud, because even Gary could hear it in his flat. I told him I wasn't too bothered by it, and Gary said that he was relieved because he didn't want me confronting the guy on my own. I'm a 20 year old girl and Gary was about 50, so I think he was just looking out for me. I asked why, and he said that he'd met the guy years beforehand through work, and he'd introduced himself as John, but when he moved into the flat, he introduced himself as Wes. Gary had gone back to one of the other guys who worked with him to double check and he said that he'd switch between the two personalities regularly so he obviously had some sort of personality disorder or something. I'm hardly an expert on stuff like that but I'd hear Wes, that's the name my boyfriend and I ended up using to refer to him, yelling quite a lot and I wondered if maybe he'd played the music to drown voices out or something. I might be way off the mark because, like I said, I'm definitely not an expert or anything. Anyway, one day I find a note taped to my door. Stop your constant banging, I can't sleep. You can tell from the handwriting too that it's been scrawled in a fury. Now, I was at work 8pm to 6pm and when I got home I pretty much sat on my sofa all night. Obviously, I made tea and went to the bathroom too, but I definitely wasn't constantly banging or anything. But Wes took it upon himself to start banging on his roof, my floor, whenever he felt like I was being too loud or something. And that's how I know it wasn't me, because he'd bang at the most random times when I hadn't even moved from the sofa for over an hour, or sometimes like at 4am when I'd be in bed for hours. My boyfriend knocked on his door a few times, but... He just never answered. And this, this is where it gets creepy. 
Now, I don't necessarily believe in ghosts to be completely honest, so I never thought much of the weird noises that I heard in that flat. I was living in a building with seven other people after all, and, and in hindsight, my boyfriend said some weird things in his sleep too, but he sleep talks rain of nonsense regularly anyway. But despite me not believing in ghosts though, I did find it super interesting and I actually have a Ouija board which I occasionally tried out. One night my boyfriend and I decided to use it too and we'd already used it once before in that flat but nothing happened. This time however, boy, it did. Mostly it was moving to random letters that didn't really make any sense but I was still feeling a, a weird vibe. I mean the candles kept flickering which I know sounds weak but I just had a, a really weird feeling about the situation for some reason. But then the board says find me. So I naturally ask, where are you? And it says, Weshed body. Like an absolute idiot, I read it that way and hastily concluded that the board was talking nonsense, said goodbye and turned the lights on. And to be completely honest, I, I was getting really freaked out and I thought that I could hear things moving and I didn't want my boyfriend to see how creeped out I was because he actually believes in ghosts and I'm always super skeptical about it. Only afterwards when I sat down on the sofa did I realize that it had actually been saying, Where's hid body? When the realization hit me, I told my boyfriend whose reaction was, Oh, I see, very funny, nice try. But to this day, he thinks I was pushing the board and playing dumb to make it seem realistic too, but I promise I wasn't. Out of curiosity, I tried to look up local murders or disappearances, but I couldn't find anything. I also can't find any social media for Wes or anything of interest about him online and I actually managed to find out his real name too. I still don't know what happened or why the board said that and I'm convinced that there's a logical explanation. A subconscious movement maybe but it did freak the hell out of me. I actually moved out of that flat a couple of months ago and I'm not gonna lie, I haven't used a Ouija board since then. I don't know if Wes hid body is referring to some sort of murder or something, but I've just kind of left it alone at this point because it, uh, it was really weird. I moved into a new place back in September and I let a buddy stay for a while since we recently reconnected. He was a, a childhood friend that's always been troubled and we didn't see each other for many years because of how much trouble he gets into. Shortly after the move though, I was laying down and hear my daughter calling for me and I went out into the hall and into her room to see what she wanted. She was actually dead asleep and I thought that that was weird but really didn't think much of it at the time. A week later or if that, my fiancé was telling me that she'd been hearing weird things and thought that the place was haunted. My buddy said the same thing and honestly I, I just kind of laughed at them. Later that night I was sitting around just playing some video games alone and some kids toys just started going off on their own and that really creeped me out a bit. If it were one or two I'd figure maybe one fell and they both went off or something but it was just about every one of the electronic toys. And after that things got really weird. Even though those experiences were creepy and could be explained away easily, the next, it couldn't and it totally pushed me over the edge. The kids had broke our TV so I had actually gotten a new one and I was in the process of setting it up and needed to open the screw package to install the legs of the TV. I opened the pack and remarked how stupid it was that they could only give us three screws when I actually needed four. The bit holder of my drill shaft wouldn't fit and I recalled that I had a handle set above my washer in a cabinet. I went back there and sitting right next to the small bit set was the fourth fucking screw. And that absolutely blew my mind. Things stayed really weird too and my buddy and I were watching how the universe works and my front door just slowly opened with no one there. Mind you, it wasn't windy and it didn't open fast or even slowly. It was kind of like someone walked in. We've seen books just pushed off the top of the refrigerator and heard footsteps a lot since then too. 
My fiancé said that she's actually going to call someone to investigate, and my buddy started telling me stories of how he'd seen himself, but with black eyes and just other really weird stuff. I then found out that he'd actually been in prison for manslaughter. In hindsight, he's actually a pretty horrible person too. Anyways, he thought that whatever was going on was actually attached to us, and when we had him leave, everything just completely stopped. Now, what the hell would attach to a person? I'm positive that whatever was going on had something to do with him, and even weirder, now that I think about it, we always had a, a ton of small flies that just would never go away, and since he's been gone, they're also gone too. I try not to think about it much anymore since it's been gone a while, but I'm really curious about what the hell could have been around here. But thinking back on it too, I'm kind of wondering now if whatever was around wasn't trying to warn us of the guy or something. Either way, those are the only paranormal experiences that I've had, but it's really weird that everything just stopped when that guy left. So, just a brief backstory to what happened. So on Christmas Day of 2009, my grandfather actually passed away in a care home. Due to a skeleton staff on shift that day and no admin staff, we weren't told until the next day. The funeral and the cremation were held in the middle of January of 2010. My grandmother planned to scatter his ashes near a river where he liked to walk when he was younger and whatnot. She had discussed this with him before his death too, and sadly, when the time came... She couldn't bring herself to scatter his ashes, and so she delayed scattering them for about three months. I remember visiting her one afternoon in 2010, and she told me and my mother that she was going to go down to the river later that evening to scatter his ashes. She actually wanted to do it alone too, and so we respected her wishes and left her to it. I went home and didn't really think much about it. But what happened next is something that I still just cannot explain. So I was sitting at my computer in the living room that evening and I noticed that the clock on the windowsill next to me had stopped. It was about 11pm but the clock had stopped at 10.20pm. I went into the kitchen to get a new battery for the clock, only to notice that the clock in the kitchen, also analog, had also stopped at exactly 10.20pm. Now, these two clocks were different sizes, different brands, and even had different brands of batteries inside. They were not radio controlled or in any way controllable to be honest and feeling a bit freaked out I went upstairs to wake up my girlfriend at the time who'd gone to bed early and I told her about this weird thing that happened. And then I noticed that the clock on the bedside table had also stopped and at exactly 10.20pm analog, battery powered and different to the other two again. So at this point, I'm thinking one clock stopping is unfortunate, two is a coincidence, but three? Three is beyond anything that I can comprehend. So I went on a hunt around the house for any more clocks, and the only other one that I could find was in our son's room, and at the time our son was only eight weeks old, and he was still sleeping in a cot in our bedroom, but his bedroom is where we'd prepared for when he was a bit older, and the clock in his room was on the shelf and was of the design of some kid's cartoon character, and... That one had also stopped at 10.20pm. So, by this time, I'm obviously more than freaked out. I replace all the batteries and the clocks just start functioning normally again. And this never happened again. It was only a couple of weeks later when I visited my grandmother again and she explained that she went down and scattered my grandfather's ashes on the day that I last saw her. I didn't mention the incident about the clocks, but... It did cross my mind and I asked her when she went down to scatter these ashes near the river. And she told me that she left it quite late but said that it would have been shortly before 10.30pm that night. A chill ran down my spine at that point because I wondered if this had any connection to what happened with those clocks. I didn't tell her about the clocks because I didn't want to frighten her and apparently my grandfather had played around with some sort of black magic once and it scared the hell out of her so I knew that she was afraid of things like this. But I did tell my mother and although she believed me, 
It didn't bother her that much because she said that she'd seen and heard my grandfather in a house until his ashes were scattered. I live in a pretty rough neighborhood. I have four other housemates, but they're all away for the festive season. We're students. At Christmas, I was gifted one of those, uh, those ring doorbells that has a camera kind of thing. I attached it to the frame outside of my door, which looks outwards towards an old pub, and a couple of days went by, and then the postman rang the doorbell, which it was pleasant, and it worked a treat. However, a couple of days later on my way back from work... I noticed that the ring bell had been stolen. I hadn't even thought about this, but of course it had to have been stolen, right? I was annoyed, but I wasn't surprised is what I'm getting at. But this, this is where it gets creepy though. Last night, the doorbell rang through to my phone. It was really late and I was still alone in the house, but the screen was dark. And it was just an image of my house which meant that the person that stole it was sitting outside, filming my house with my own ring doorbell. I was pretty shaken by this. The area is pretty rough, and I've been assaulted and robbed once before. The image quickly turned black as if the culprit had placed the doorbell back in their pocket or something. I peered out the curtain at around where I thought the person had been filming the house from, but no one was there. I haven't told many people this story because, well, it, it happened 22 years ago when I was just a, a naive, attention-starved 12-year-old girl. The friends I told back then probably paid little attention to and definitely won't remember it now, so I, I won't bother changing any names. And to be honest, it probably wasn't even his real name anyway. So I'm from a large town in North England. When I was 12, my mum bought me my first mobile telephone for my birthday. I'd been nagging and nagging her for one, so I was just so, so happy, and I can't remember the make, but it had an aerial, and all you could do was text and make phone calls on it. It was a, a real brick of a phone, too. I remember a single text cost around 25p, and barely anyone I knew at that age had a phone, too, so I didn't do much with it, other than walk around pretending to be on the phone. Over the next few months, more of my friends got phones too and free message center numbers came out. I don't know if anyone will remember them, but it was where you could uh, enter a code into the settings and your text would be free and unlimited. It was huge and so with that came the game of changing the last digit of your telephone number and texting all the different outcomes. This is how I met Alex. He started texting me back and it was all innocent to me back then and he told me he was a 24 year old DJ in a nightclub and lived in Leicestershire in the UK. I thought he was really interesting and didn't want him to stop talking to me so I told him that I was 14 thinking that this was an acceptable age for a 24 year old man to be talking to. He called me often too and my mum and dad were out of earshot. I wasn't stupid enough to realise that they wouldn't let me talk to him. But we talk about things like... Uh, like school, his job, just normal things, and I liked how he spoke to me, like I was a grown-up and I was interesting. After a few months of just innocently chatting, he asked if we could meet, and I'd, he'd drive up to see me. I was nervous because I'd actually lied to him about my age and that he might not like me, so I told him I had something to tell him and that I was actually 12. He called me and softly told me not to worry, that he didn't care, but that he had something to tell me too. He was actually 30. Now, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I didn't care too much, and from here on he just text me saying how much he'd like to kiss me, asking me about my underwear, and just generally being a pervert. But, being stupid and young, I found it flattering and went along with it. I didn't mention earlier, but I was badly bullied in my earlier school years, and at around the age of 11 or 12, I developed early and discovered makeup, and all of a sudden, I, I started getting much more positive attention from people. In other words, I was the perfect victim for someone like this. So we eventually met up, and he drove up to my town about two hours away from Leicestershire, in an old dark blue car, picked me up around the corner from my house, and took me to the pub. 
He was tall, had dark curly hair, and quite large front teeth. I honestly don't remember too much about him, and he bought me a lager, and we sat in the corner of this dingy pub, him with his arm around me telling me how beautiful I was. At the time, I had absolutely no clue how wrong this was, and I was totally naive, and all I can remember thinking is, I hope nobody who knows my mum sees us. After a few drinks, we got back into his car, and he drove around looking for a, a quiet spot. Whilst on the road, a police car was driving towards us, and he suddenly became very irritable and demanded that I put my seatbelt on and sit back. But this obviously rang some alarm bells, even in my 12-year-old mind. We eventually did find a quiet spot, and I did a lot of kissing, although I, I wouldn't let him go any further than that, despite him trying. I then told him that I wanted to go home because I started to feel dirty. That's the only way that I can describe it and it just didn't feel right. He did take me home and I never saw or heard from him again. However, a 12 year old me wanted some answers. So after texting and calling his mobile and getting no response for a week or two, I called his landline which I had stored on my phone through him ringing me on it a, a few weeks earlier. and. A woman answered. When I asked for Alex, she started questioning who I was and what I wanted with him. I told her everything and it turned out that she was actually his wife and they had two children together. I didn't call again and I heard nothing more from him and pretty much forgot all about him. I have my own daughter now and she's eight and it's memories like this one that disturb me so much because I would absolutely destroy anyone who preyed on her in the same way. I know a lot of you guys are going to say that I was dumb and yes I was, I was a kid. I didn't know what was wrong or right at the time and I didn't have any positive figure in my life to kind of help me out with this stuff. It was actually very stupid of me and extremely dangerous to do what I did. I'm a 16 year old male and I don't really partake in any sports. I'm a computer programmer, gamer and avid comic, I'm a book and movie enthusiast. With that being said, to compensate for my lack of physical activity, I work out at least four times a week to maintain a, a reasonable physique. I have a membership at my local 24 hour gym and I started going there two years ago. It's a pretty big establishment, they have multiple floors but I usually spend my time in the main floor which has a spacious room with all of the workout equipment that you could want. I usually do a full body workout when I go so I tend to use all of the equipment too. That being said, about last week this started. So after I finish my cardio, I go down to the padded area where people typically do their ab workouts and I get started going through my routine. I'm in the middle of doing my plank and I notice a guy kind of ostensibly staring at me. He was on my right and was wearing sunglasses so I gave him the benefit of the doubt and wrote it off as him just looking at something else as I couldn't see his actual eyes. After I proceed to my next exercise, he quickly leaves my head until I get to doing my squats. And that's where he is very obviously staring at me. His head was turned in my direction and there was nothing else to look at. I give him the benefit of the doubt though again because maybe he was just thinking about something. That thought though was completely diminished when he came over and without solicitation touched me proclaiming that... I wasn't doing my squats right, which I of course knew was complete bullcrap. At this point, he had his hand on my glutes and let me also say that I'm very clearly underage. I do not look a day over 15 and everything about this situation was just wrong and I knew it too. But I was honestly paralyzed and after I snapped out of it, I, I thanked him and told him that I got it. He smiled with the most perverted and creepy smile ever and he goes back to his area and continues to stare me down like a hawk stalking its prey. I stupidly don't report him and don't tell anybody about the situation and I was just extremely perturbed nonetheless. I go back the next day and I pray that he isn't there. But lo and behold, I see him sitting around with his creepy sunglasses again. 
When he sees me, he smiles creepily at me and waves. I don't reciprocate at all, mind you, and I just wanted to avoid all confrontation with this guy. I do my cardio with that incident, and when I get to the padded area, he's ostensibly not there, but in the middle of my workout, the guy just plops down next to me and asks, Hey buddy, how often do you come to the gym? I was honestly startled and responded with a slurred, when I can. I put back in my earbuds in hope that that would give him the signal that I had no interest in conversing whatsoever. I start doing my push-ups, and out of the corner of my eye, the creep's just laying there analyzing me. He then decided to give me an anatomy of the bicep and he started touching my arm and he was almost caressing it. I just awkwardly said okay and I was trying to be as cordial as possible since I didn't want to retaliate and potentially mischaracterize him or something. I go to this gym often and didn't want to develop a reputation or anything. But he then started putting his hand toward my crutch and that's when I sprung up and I just left. The people around me looked disconcerted and one woman went up to me and asked if I knew this man to which I replied no. I still didn't report the guy as I feared that I misconstrued what he was doing and that he was just trying to help me or something. The next couple of times I went I actually didn't see him at all but yesterday is when things escalated to a point where I knew this guy had malicious intentions. So I'm back at the ab workout area and the guy doesn't confront me at all but has his iPhone pointed at me in a really suspicious way. It looked as if he was taking pictures of me or recording me and I was freaked out but I couldn't say anything because for all I knew he was just reading an article or something. I was unsettled but I just continued my workout. After my workout I go to wash my hands in the locker room People in there have a tendency to just kind of walk around naked, which I find to be pretty repulsive, but there's actually no rules against it, so this sick creep is in the locker room and I curse myself under my breath, and while I'm washing my hands, the bastard comes up literally right behind me and says, after workout, you should shower, come with me, I'll help. I tell him to get lost and that I'm reporting him to the gym and the police and everybody else in there hears this and I don't know what happened to him in there as I just hauled ass out of there as quick as possible. I did act according to my threat and I reported him to the gym but I didn't have a name and there were no cameras in the locker room so the only evidence I have is him touching me in the gym. I tell my father and obviously he's infuriated. My father goes to the same gym and when I described the guy to him, my father said that he recognized who I was talking about. He said that the guy always talks to younger people in the gym and that it always creeped him out. And that is where we're up to for now. But we're going to file a police report pretty soon and I'll let you guys know if there's uh, any further details. I was a teenager in the 90s and on this particular night had found myself stuck in downtown. It was around midnight when I finally found a semi well lit bus stop and I looked at the bus schedule and realized that I had missed the last bus of the night unless it was late. And so I decided to wait on the bench for a little while just to see if the bus would come. But moments later a tall man walked up and sat right next to me. There was plenty of space to sit elsewhere for him, mind you, but he huddled up nice and close. He was wearing all black, including a black leather jacket, and he started making smooth conversation with me, and I finally looked over at him, and he was very tan, had shiny wavy black hair, and really orange eyes. Like a, a bright hazel orange snake looking eye, which contrasted with his dark features and clothes. I know this is going to sound a little bit weird, but he looked really like the devil in person. He took off his leather jacket and laid it across my lap to keep me warm, and I took it off and handed it back to him and said, no thanks. He kept draping it back on my lap, and I looked around for other people, and only saw a passed out homeless person sleeping on the bench. He was trying to coerce me into getting a ride with him because it's so late and he's worried about me and my bus isn't coming and I'm not safe. I said no thanks, my bus should be here any minute. 
in my mind. I, I didn't know if the bus would actually be here at all, but the streets were dead and dark and I was scared to leave this only spot that was well lit. After what seemed like an eternity, my bus finally came. It was the most beautiful bus that I'd ever seen. I quickly got up and said my bus is here and he, he sneered at the bus and said under his breath, you got lucky. I got on the bus and saw at the window that he was walking to his car in a dark parking lot across the street from where the stop was. He stood next to his car waving at me to come to him as if that would change my mind. I was a wild teen that partied a lot and I would stay downtown just all hours of the night and thought that I was invincible but after that incident I never stayed out late again, especially alone. I actually think that I really did get lucky that night and I had no intention of pushing it again. I've been listening to scary stories for a while and although not as extreme as many of the stories here, I keep remembering an encounter that I had when I was just a little girl around 9 years old or so. Since it's been nearly a decade, my my memory on it's a, a bit hazy, but some of it's burned into my mind forever. So, it was a regular day, and for some reason I decided to go to the nearby forest to take some pictures, which I had never done before. Now, the forest is almost right next to our house, and it's not very big. There's an elementary school next to it, so kids often play there too. It was a quiet day, and probably the weekend, I think, so there wasn't really anyone around. Back then, they were making a proper jogging path circling around the forest, and I'm not sure why, but at the time, the path was just pure mud and impossible to walk on. So, I opted for the old and smaller path, which worked out better for me and my pictures anyway in terms of scenery. I had barely gotten into the forest. You could still very clearly see the neighbors near it, and I had only managed to snap a couple of photos when I noticed someone standing some ways behind me. I immediately felt a, a bit uncomfortable, but only because I didn't like being seen taking random pictures in the forest. I decided to walk a bit further away to keep taking my pictures and I noticed the person starting to follow me. I got sort of freaked out by this and my subconscious kicked in to tell me that something was probably wrong here, so after a while and at a point where the old and the new path converged, I hopped onto the muddy new path. It was a struggle to walk in, but... Thankfully, I was wearing rain boots and they were completely submerged in the mud. After walking for a while, I had the courage to look behind me. Maybe around 60 feet behind me, I saw what at the time looked like a, a middle-aged man just standing there and looking at me. It felt like that moment just went on forever, but it was probably only just a couple of seconds before he turned around and just quietly walked away. I stood there for a while before starting to leave and I definitely didn't want to stay in the forest any longer. I walked along the muddy path, too scared to step off it and I thought maybe the man hadn't followed me on that path because of how impossible it was to walk in. I finally got to my grandparents house since they lived right in the neighborhood at the time and I sat there in their swings and quickly texted my best friend about everything that had happened. At this point, I was starting to calm down because I'd been crying the whole time that I was walking out of the forest. I got home and wasn't planning to talk about it, but I just immediately burst into tears and I told my mum everything. She comforted me for a bit and said that maybe it was just some sort of older guy living in the neighbourhood who was curious about the person walking in the forest. Her reasoning being that pretty much everyone knows each other around here and maybe he was just lonely or something. I never bought what she said though because the man had not once raised his voice to say something to me and just quietly followed me for quite some time. If there's one thing I know about the old people around here too, it's that they'll just immediately strike up a conversation. I'm also pretty sure that it wasn't an older person and my mum probably misunderstood because I think I described him as a, an old man. But to a little girl, anyone over 40 would have looked like an old man to me. I never really brought it up again, but it's definitely been on my mind sometimes. I actually live in a pretty safe country, Finland, in a very safe neighborhood, so sometimes I, I question if maybe I just overreacted to the situation. But then again, 
Why does just some random old man follow a, a small girl through a forest for a, quite some time? All I can put it down to is that this guy was following me because he was up to something. This happened last year in May, and at the time I was 15 years old and I was in the 10th grade at high school. My high school has an afternoon program for the 9th and 10th graders, and this meant that my classes started at 12pm and I sometimes finished at 5 or 6pm, rarely at 7pm too. For three days, on the 25th, the 26th and the 27th of May, I've been attending a convention. Eastern European Comic Con, which was really far away from home and on the other side of the city. To get there from home, I, I had to use the subway, about nine stations, and the bus about six stations. Because the first day of the convention was the 25th, a Friday, I went directly from my high school with my best friend Mary and stayed only two to three hours. I didn't want to come home late, and honestly I was just really exhausted because I finished my classes at 5.30pm. Also, the, the roads are really busy on a Friday night. Everything was fine and I came home really happy because I had lots of fun. The next day it was the 26th and it was a Saturday and usually on the weekends, the subway is 10 times more empty and the roads get busy only in the evening. So I met my friend at the bus station in the morning at 9am and we went together to the convention. There, we met other friends and stayed about 10 to 11 hours. And she had to wait for her mum to come and pick her up, but and my parents insisted that I had to get home using the public transport system. They said this because they thought that it would be an inconvenience for her parents to pick me up. Clearly, though, this is something that my parents regret now. Everything was fine during the bus ride home, though. I was listening to music, scrolling through Facebook, and just minding my own business. When I got to the subway, it was really empty and you could barely see any people. It was about 8pm-ish, so it wasn't a really big surprise. But because I had to change to the thoroughfare, I needed to walk about 5 minutes still on the subway to get to the train that leads to the nearest station to my home. As I was waiting for the train, a, a man starts walking around me. He was in his 30s and he was looking pretty bad and... He had red puffy eyes and dirt on his hands and face too. At first he walked past me, three times mind you, and I felt like he was walking in circles around me or something. As an instinct, I, I put my phone in my pocket and took off my headphones and unplugged them. The train arrived in about four minutes and it honestly felt like an eternity. I sat down and tried not to panic and he sat down right next to me. We were the only ones in the subway wagon and... I thought to myself, why would you sit right next to me when there are just lots of empty seats? There was an old man that was sitting at the other end of the train and I wanted to get to him so I could feel a little bit safer and as I stood up, this dude literally grabbed my hand and pulled me really hard and I fell back on my seat. He started smiling and said, if you don't sit right here next to me, it's going to be bad, girl. And at this point, I started crying. I tried to stay calm and react normal and I nodded and he let go of my hand and in this time I, I looked and examined him really well. He was wearing ripped jeans and a t-shirt with holes in it and a, a jean jacket. And he started asking me questions. How old am I? What's my name? Where am I coming from? What do I have in my bag? All sorts of questions. He was actually speaking aggressively too and I didn't know what to do. But when he saw that I wasn't answering, he mumbled something and then started talking about his interests, the Norse gods and Norse mythology, and I don't know what made him talk about this topic, but I just sat there, listening. It's been almost ten minutes at this point, and I felt like I, I had no escape. I heard footsteps, and in that moment, I looked up and realized that the train was almost reaching the second to the last station. The footsteps were coming from the old man that I saw earlier and he looked at me and said, Where have you been? I've been calling you and texting you for hours. Come on, we need to go home. I sighed in relief and I could hear the dude mumbling something again. And just before the train stopped too, he asked me if I'm willing to give him my phone number so that we could chat again. I told him that I couldn't and that I just really had to go. The old man gave him a look and we got off the train together. 
we started walking towards the exit, and when we saw that the train left the station, we stopped. He looked at me and said, is this your station? Are you okay? Did he hurt you? Is there anything I can do for you? I saw the way that he pulled at you and heard the way he spoke and thought that you may need some help. I told the man that I had exactly one more station and that I was okay and just a little bit scared. He advised me that I should talk with a security guard and tell him what just happened and so I, I did. I kept thanking the old man for what he had done for me though and I took the next train and I texted my dad and told him to pick me up from our subway station immediately. In about three or four minutes I got off the train and I was at my station and as I was climbing the stairs to reach the exit... I heard someone yelling, you lying bitch. I didn't have time to turn around because I was knocked down and I screamed so hard and I started crying and started to sort of move to get this man off me. But because I talked to that security guard at the other station, thank god, two other security guards were waiting to check on me. But they were equipped with a taser and when they heard me screaming they rushed over and helped me to get up and they put the man down. They told me to call the police and to wait for someone to take me home and I told them that my dad was upstairs outside the underground area and I just ran to my dad and told him everything and he called the police. The man was arrested and we actually spoke to someone from the media for a short time but they refused to make this case public because the man was a gypsy and it would have been racist to shame his ethnicity and to show the bad side of this minority. To this day I... I still wonder what was on his mind and what would have happened if that old man wasn't around. This experience still shakes me up to this day. I don't know exactly what happened and I live in a very safe neighborhood which just makes this even creepier because it goes to show that you never know what may lie beneath. So my nephew was about five years old. I was asked to babysit him for the night and I was young at the time and didn't really know how to watch a kid so I would figured I'd just put on Netflix for a few hours. We went to the kids section of Netflix and started watching some show about talking cars or something. But this was about 5pm so it was sunlight out and perpendicular to the couch is a, a sliding glass door and the curtain for the door was open. I was sitting on the couch with my nephew as we watched TV together. My nephew really liked the show too, so we kept watching. This went on for a few hours until it was dark outside and in my foolishness, I turned on some lights but I never did shut the curtain. It was one of those things where other people can see in but all you see from inside is the blackness of the night. My backyard is adjacent to a big field so there's no street lights out there or anything too. And suddenly, I heard the sound of one of the deck chairs being dragged across the deck. I instantly recognized this sound and just assumed it was my parents. Why they would have come home and silently then go outside to move around deck furniture in the middle of the night is something I just didn't really think about. Like I said, it's a safe neighborhood. We watched TV though for maybe an hour until it was bedtime and when I brought my nephew to bed... I realized my parents had been home and I asked them who was out on the deck. But they both denied ever going out on the deck and that creeped me out a bit. So I went to the kitchen and turned on the deck light and from the window I could see that the deck chair had been dragged from its usual spot at the outside table about 5 or 10 feet away to the sliding glass door. The chair was directly facing the window less than a foot away from the glass too. But right in front of the opening in the curtains. From where it was, the person would have had a perfect view of me and my nephew, and the chair was positioned like someone had just pulled it up and taken a seat, like we were the show or something. I never noticed anyone outside the window or felt like I was being watched or anything, which, I, I don't know, kind of makes it creepier in a way. But it gets worse. The next day, I went out to take a look and I found two big handprints with the fingers spread out on my bedroom window. My bedroom window was on the first floor. Luckily the room used to be my brother's and he's had some problems with sneaking girls in and so my parents installed some pretty good locks to the point where the window just can't be opened anymore. To this day I have no idea what happened. 
It's been several years with no other signs of Peeping Tom since then, but safe to say, the incident shook me to my core. And I don't leave my curtains open at night anymore. This happened years ago, and it still gives me the shivers when I think about it. I was actually in grade 8 at the time. So, it was late at night, and I was laying in bed just trying to sleep. It was summertime, and it was really hot outside, so I had my bedroom window open. My window had a screen on it so that no bugs could get in, too. When, all of a sudden, I, I heard some faint banging up against the house below my window. It woke me out of my sleep and I called out for my mum, whose bedroom was across the hall, and she came into my room and turned the light on. I said I heard something outside. She replied with something along the lines of, just go back to sleep, it was probably just the wind. So, I eventually fell asleep. The next morning I woke up like normal and carried on with my day, and a few hours later we were all going out as a family somewhere. I forget where we were going. And as we were walking out the door to our vehicle, my dad says, why is the ladder up against the house? We all looked over and there was a, a ladder leaning up against my bedroom window. My mum started freaking out and ran to my room and looked at my window and after inspecting my window she noticed that the window screen, it had been cut open as if someone had taken a knife to it. And then it clicked. Those noises that I heard the night before against the house was someone trying to take a freaking ladder to my window and cut my screen open. But they must have heard me wake up and call out to my mum or something and got scared and just ran off. But this incident, it gives me chills to this day because I often think, what if I didn't wake up? What if they got into my bedroom? What would have happened? Nothing like that's ever happened to me or my family before, so... It really scared me and I didn't sleep for weeks. I kept my window shut and locked at all times, even if it was too hot. I have no idea who it was and we haven't had any incidences since then. And my parents still live in the same house too, but it was really creepy nonetheless. So yesterday... I was hiking at the Barton Creek Greenbelt like I do almost every week and I decided to go off trail which I had done many times before. Except this time I went much deeper into the woods than I ever had before. I was following the river when I stumbled upon a cave and it was kind of small and I would have had to have crawled on my belly to get in and so I was alone and I decided to pass on that for the time being. Not long after though, I, I found two more caves next to each other. These were much bigger and I could see some sort of support beams not far inside. I approached the larger of the two and began to enter when suddenly I saw a pair of red eyes blink from the darkness. This threw me off obviously as I wasn't expecting to find anything in there and I decided to just leave whatever was in there alone but on my way back I passed the cave again and curiosity took hold of me and I decided to enter once more to take a brief look. This time I didn't see any eyes so I figured the thing that was there before must have left. I went in a bit further where I heard shuffling deeper in the cave. I froze trying to listen and the shuffling seemed to be going away from me and I started to back out when I heard just a blood curdling scream. It came from the darkness and I just bolted, not knowing what it was or what it would do to me and upon researching later, I found that the scream that I had heard was actually similar to that of a supposed skinwalker scream that I found on YouTube. But could this be real or a prank? I don't know, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. I'll update you guys with pictures and a video when I go back with some friends. My ex-wife and I purchased a home in Missouri in 2000. We had three children at the time and the house, in our words at the time, seemed to be asking for us to buy it. It seemed so full of light and just inviting and I was a total skeptic at the time but it didn't take long for us to notice things happening. 
It all started with candles just going out that we lit. That happens from time to time, so we didn't pay a lot of attention to it except for when they appeared to just blow out right in front of us. But then the banging started. Every night at 10.15pm, we heard what sounded like a chest of drawers falling over in one of the bedrooms upstairs. And this went on for months. Then in the master bedroom upstairs, we would occasionally hear what sounded like several kids running and playing. Except... All of the kids were either in school or downstairs at the time. I would go up and check and every time I went up, there was nothing there. But then, we would both wake up at night and we started seeing a dark figure standing beside the bed. But one night, my ex-wife ran downstairs where I was, terrified because the dark figure was on top of her in the bed. I would smell perfume in the house that just wasn't any of hers and I would smell it when I was there alone and... Many, many times I, I felt such an oppression or terror that I would have to leave the house and didn't find any relief until I was outside. We actually had three babies while we lived there too and three of them have played with something while they were in their cribs alone. When they were able to talk they called the playmate Stephen but that was the name of their older brother and he was asleep upstairs at the time. One of our daughters would actually wake up screaming every night too and I set up a video camera in the room on her crib and the first night, it happened. I was happy that I caught it on camera but reviewing the footage at the time the screaming happened, the camera was knocked over and turned off right before the incident. But many, many times I would close and lock the front door which had an old deadlock and by the time I left the foyer, the door would click and open on its own. But the basement smelt like cat piss the entire time we lived there and after the first six months or so, I went so far as scrubbing the entire basement, more like a cellar, with bleach, but it always smelled like ammonia or cat piss down there. But we had neighbors that told us that they thought the house was haunted, and they would see someone in the master bedroom window at the front of the house that wasn't one of us, and I've heard my name called behind me when no one else was in the house. But the most shocking series of incidents was this. So my son, who was about five at the time, had the bedroom upstairs. I put him into bed and he was afraid, saying that there were these mean guys in the walls that kept waking him up at night. I told him that I'll be mad at them and to come and tell me if that happened, and well, he did tell me several times, but I couldn't find anything going on. One night I put him to bed and closed the closet door that was open and stopped at his door to tell him goodnight again, and he said he's not in there anymore and pointed to the closet door and it was open i closed it again and told him that it was okay and about an hour later he came back down and told me that joshua was in his room again and that he brought the mean guys i walked him back upstairs and put him to bed and assured him that he would be okay and about 15 minutes later i heard my son crying so i started upstairs to check on him and found him lying on the stair landing. I asked him what was wrong and he said, crying and shaking, it's okay, they can have my room. And he slept with me that night. We moved from that house around 2007 or so I think and I had to go back a few times alone during the moving process and I felt like I was uh, an intruder and someone was pissed that I was there. I never stayed any longer than I had to and I always left very quickly and I'm really glad to not be living there anymore but I've often wanted to contact the new owners and ask them if they'd had any experiences like we did. But there are many more experiences mind you that I could talk about but I'll end with this one. While we were moving out my wife had an antique vanity that I bought for her and as we loaded it up we noticed at the bottom of one of the legs the words help me was scratched or deeply gouged into it and i can guarantee that that was not there when i bought it because i touched up the scratches when i brought it home i recently ran into an old co-worker from our time that we worked at the sandwich shop in the truck stop we chatted for a while before he had to leave, but I started thinking about my stint at that place, and specifically the creepy sandwich guy. 
In college, I worked some overnights at that truck stop. Uh, it was a pretty safe place in a smaller town, and there had only been three incidents in the four years the place had been open before I got hired. One trucker got robbed, apparently, and one group of ladies arrested for, well, servicing the truckers, if you catch my drift, and one OD. I was never really worried, even though my co-worker seemed a little concerned that I was a young girl working overnight at a truck stop when there was only one other employee in the whole place. Usually though, it was just really slow and most of the time I'd get three or four truckers come in within the first hour, a couple of people coming in with the munchies and ordered three dozen cookies one time, but usually it was maybe one or two hours between things. So I'd spend about three hours just cleaning ovens, finishing dishes, deep cleaning the lobby, that kind of thing, and then I'd go to spend whatever time between customers just doing homework. The overnight boss on the other side, the gas station side, was cool as long as everything was cleaned and tempered regularly. A few weeks before I inevitably left this place, a guy came in about 20 minutes before my shift was over, so it was about 5am by this point. My co-worker had arrived early so he could fill out some paperwork that he had to get done so he was sitting in the back office already and I started making this customer sandwich and making chit chat like usual. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary and he told me that it was driving from New York to Wisconsin, asked me a little bit about how my night had been and nothing crazy. I wrapped up his sub, rang it up and threw in a small discount for him since he seemed nice and I was just happy I was getting ready to go home for a few hours of sleep before I headed to campus. When I went to take his change, though, things just went really wrong. He dropped the coins in my hand, but suddenly he had his grip tied around my wrist, and the next thing I knew, I'm on the other side of the counter on the floor. He'd yanked me across the counter and still had a tight grip on my wrist, and thank God my co-worker was there. And the manager on the other side had slipped into the bathroom, so to this guy's knowledge, I was the only one there for that moment. But my co-worker, while filling out his papers, was looking at the cameras and had seen everything. He was out of the back in just seconds after I hit the ground and before I really knew what was going on, he had chased the guy outside. He didn't pursue him far, afraid that someone else was nearby who would come after me, so he ran back inside, locked the door to our side of the store and shouted for the manager to call the police. The cops came and they searched the area and watched the security videos, but nothing ever really came from it. The guy just disappeared and I never heard anything about him. After that though, I put in my two weeks notice the following day after my nerves had calmed down and I was switched around so I worked during the day around my classes for my last few days. And they made it a policy that two people were to be working both sides of the truck stop on overnights from that point on. I still live about a, a half an hour from there I think and honestly I, I haven't gone back since my last day just because that memory is still in my mind almost eight years later. My friend has a rescue dog named Indy, and it's the goofiest thing ever. It never runs out of energy and would never hurt someone on purpose. A really good boy, but just way too much energy. He's a German Shepherd Red Healer mix, and I've never seen him angry. And coming from my friend, the following story has scared me more than any other that I've heard. So she lived in an apartment next to a park, and she likes to walk at night because of insomnia, something that she only felt safe doing with her dog at her side and sticking to the lit sidewalk. They were just ambling along, enjoying the night like usual, when with no warning, all of Indy's hair stands on end, hackles raised, and he just looks and sounds ready to kill, but she can't tell why. She's trying to calm him down when movement catches her eye, and suddenly... There's a guy just barreling through the park straight at them about a hundred feet away. He's trying to go so fast that he's almost falling forward, but he wasn't yelling or making noise like he needed help or anything. Indy quickly yanked the leash and ran as fast as he could, dragging my friend behind him. The man is still following and still making no sounds too. They got to the apartment building and the moment she unlocked the door, Indy slammed it open and she shut up behind her. And the man was suddenly absolutely nowhere to be seen. But Indy was still trying to drag her into the apartment and when they got into their apartment, he still wouldn't calm down and he just kept pacing and was really on edge. In fact, it took hours for him to settle down and it wasn't until later that she realized that this may be because the guy was still wandering around outside the building or something. 
We will never be sure what happened to that man or what he wanted. I can't imagine it was anything that wouldn't have ended in my friend's death, but since then, Indy has only had that reaction to one other person, who my friend is pretty sure was stalking her. The dog's reaction only confirming it for her. Honestly, I don't want to imagine what would have happened if Indy hadn't sensed that man somehow that night. Because the way he was running, it certainly sounds like he was trying to grab her. Two years ago, my SO and I found the perfect place to rent. It was a small tract of fabricated homes, and the neighborhood was nice. It was quiet, which for two college seniors wanting out of the noisy dorms was honestly just heaven. Now, because this was in Arizona, and it was prefab houses, and most of the folks that lived in our neighborhood were 60 or older, save a few. To our left, Sandra and David, an awesome couple in their early 60s, but both retired postal workers, they spend summers in Maine and winters here. To our right, Carol, a 40-something who supposedly owned her own home business. She actually looked like she uh, perpetually was sucking a lemon, and she was just always a little bit off. At first, she would occasionally join my SO for a smoke on the porch, or if we barbecued with Dave or Sandy, we would invite her over. But to say that she was awkward, too, was putting it lightly. We suspected, in fact, that maybe she was on the spectrum or something. We'd just be eating, and she would describe how her mother died a slow, agonizing death when a tumor in her throat burst. Or there was this time where she described in great detail her latest yeast infection. I kid you not. Anyway, sometimes I would work out on my porch, and I had a small bench with a bar and some weights and whatnot, and one day, I'm lifting when I almost dropped the bar on my neck because leaning over me was Carol. She then mumbled, I could have snapped your neck like a twig, and I sat up and I said pardon, and she said, I said you could have really hurt yourself. I doubted at the time what I had heard, chalking it up to not hearing her correctly, but she had this really sinister smirk on her face. After that, I just tried my best to ignore her, However, I had told my SO my suspicions that maybe old Carol was a, a bit insane. I come home from class one evening and my SO and Carol are on the porch. I went inside because I was coming down with something and honestly, I just wanted to go to bed. So my SO comes in and tells me that she's going to a job. She works nights at a, a dispatcher for the campus police. I'm completely out of it though, so she kisses me goodnight, says that she'll lock up the house and will see me in the morning. Around 1am, I, I wake up covered in sweat and I go to get a glass of water and drink it down. I see my SO, or who I assume is my SO, on the couch and I'm so out of it that I just crawl back into bed and fall to sleep. The next morning, I wake up and my SO comes to the door telling me that work was just crazy I say to her, wait, you weren't at work, you were here, right? She looks at me funny and I immediately get a sick feeling in my gut. A fever or no fever, I know that I saw someone on that couch that night. My SO writes it off as just a fever dream and the house was locked up and whatnot. I forget about it and life goes on, graduation is approaching and things with my side of the family, well specifically my egg donor, go badly. A long story. SO is offered a job back in her home state of NYC so we give notice to our landlord and we let Sandy and Dave know and one night we tell Carol too. She blinks at us and then gets up and heads over to her house not saying a word and we just brush it off as just weird Carol again. That night, we're asleep when I hear creaking coming from the living area. I sit up and now SO hears it too and she grabs my arm and I grab the metal bat under my bed. I ask who's there and whack the door and there's some thuds. And thank God it was locked and my SO dials 911. Meanwhile, I'm watching as someone begins recreating the door scene from the fucking shining except whoever was doing it was using a small hatchet this time. But they're still making progress on the door as it was pretty much hollow and the six minutes it took for the police to get there, man, it just felt like a lifetime. I can now see the hatchet's tip in the door and suddenly we hear the cops tell someone to put their weapon down. 
I had no idea who it was until we were let out of the place, and on the couch in cuffs is Carol. We learned after that she had apparently been in and out of jail for a long time, and supposedly she just went cuckoo for cocoa puffs from long-term use of meth. She was arrested and charged with breaking and entering and destruction of property, and they tried to get her on attempted assault, but she made a plea deal that included some kind of psychiatric treatment or something. Now, I never could prove that she was in my place that day that I was sick, but I'm sure that it was her. And as we were moving, I was messing around with our storage space, and, and there was a, a really small crawl space under the home. But we had never used it, and honestly, I, I pretty much forgot about it. But curious, I crawled around underneath the house and saw that if you kicked hard enough, you could get to the screen that led to the outside of it easily. And who knows just how many times she might have been in our place or under the house listening to us or something. But we still keep in touch with Sandy and Dave. The unit Carol rented was actually sold and they haven't seen her since. She was carted off to jail. And thankfully, we're now thousands of miles away and we never have to see her again. So there was this guy in my high school that was actually a really funny dude. Pretty popular and almost everyone got along with. He didn't bully anyone that I can recall anyway, and it was impossible not to laugh when he was around. He was a, a genuinely goofy guy, the class clown type. Now, he would say hi to me to strike up conversation and even compliment me sometimes. And uh, being an awkward teenage girl in a, an extremely cringeworthy emo phase, I was pretty flattered. I wasn't used to getting attention like that, so it was nice to have a guy around the school that would just randomly say, you look really cute today. I wasn't interested in him romantically at all though, but he was more of just a, a funny acquaintance that made me smile every once in a while. He added me on Facebook, like he did with almost all of the kids in his grade, and the grade below his too. After a while, he asked if I wanted to hang out with him after school, and I contemplated it, but there was a faint voice in the back of my head saying that it probably wasn't a good idea. Nothing really screaming danger, but something in my gut was just telling me to be wary. So I just never took him up on his offers, even if other people were around. He also asked my best friend to hang out after school, but she also never accepted, and we would talk about how weird it was that he would ask us separately to hang out with him after school, since we weren't the type of girls that he was known to date. And we both agreed that we just really would rather not. Anyway, time passed, life went on, and I just completely forgot about the guy. That is... Until about a week ago when one of my friends shared an article about a bar in the next town over that was under scrutiny for supposedly aiding predators who hunted there or something to that effect. I can't remember exactly what the article said because I was more focused on something else in the article. That guy that I went to school with is now in prison for raping two women. And that bar was apparently his hunting ground word around my hometown is that they weren't his only two victims too, just the two that got justice. I work at a performing arts theater. The building is city owned but the city hired a contract company to run the place including technicians, managers, box office employees and we bring on volunteers to man the concessions and hand out programs during a show. It's a smaller 500 seat theatre, flanked on either side by the community centre and public library. And because of this, it's a very community orientated theatre, with around 80% of our clients returning annually to put their shows on. We have a lot of youth theatre, dance companies and school bands perform here, so many of our shows are just made up of kids, ranging from as little as 3 or 4 to all the way to 17. But take note of this too. Now, for some background about me, I grew up in this theatre because my mum was the building manager for many years, so me and my twin sister would always be around after school sitting in the lobby doing homework or cartwheeling and somersaulting around and just having fun while my mum wrapped up her work. But when she left, she trained the new manager, a young mid-twenties woman called Diana, and they became friends. 
Some years later, I started volunteering with a local youth theatre group who performed at the theatre. I was a stagehand and would run out during blackouts to change the set and the props in between scenes during a show. Eventually, I was their stage manager, a paid position, but left them after they neglected to pay me in a timely manner. After that, I was a, a gymnastics coach for little kids, but grew tired of it quickly and started looking for another job. By now, I was 16 and a junior in high school. For all three years of high school, I was helping with the annual musical, put on by the choir and drama department, so I would be at the theatre helping with that once a year and whatnot. The choir teacher was actually a real creep too, but that isn't my story to tell. So as a junior preparing for college, I was starting to think about my interests and what I might want to do for college. I was really into art at the time and because of all my experience, I was also interested in the backstage behind the scenes aspect of theatre. After quitting the gymnastics gig, my dad was really on my ass to get a job so I headed to the theatre and asked to see a technical director. But the technical director, his name was Dave, was in charge of overseeing everything tech related sound, lights, meeting with clients to help coordinate and plan their shows with the equipment we have. Like I said, it's a small theatre so there are only three technicians on staff. The sound guy, Mark, the lighting woman, Sarah and Dave who was a lighting guy but knew everything about everything to be the director. So anyway, I go in to talk to Dave about a possible job. Now, I grew up in this theatre my mum hired these guys when she was actually the manager of the theatre and they all knew who I was both from when I was little and when I would come in with the theatre group in my high school for shows. He was a really friendly, charismatic guy with a funny sense of humour and I asked if he was hiring technicians and he said, sure, we could use an extra hand, basically see you Monday. And he didn't even ask for a resume or anything. This made sense though to me because, I mean, he knew me and he knew my work ethic and probably hired me as a favour to my mum, who knows. When I started I met Mark and Sarah and Sarah was really nice, about 30 years old, a little reserved but she definitely meant business so was only a tad intimidating to a 16 year old me. Mark was late 20s, was very quirky and quiet, sort of a goth type I think. He was a smaller dude too, bald and had tattoos but nice enough. He and Dave, who was really tall and lankier, had been best friends since high school too and they were both very clearly sort of social outcasts and had definitely dabbled in punk and goth phases. I thought that they were really cool in fact as at this point in my life I had just sort of uh, exited a, a wannabe emo phase but still dressed in kind of quirky clothing and dyed my hair outlandish colours and whatnot. So they brought me on and began training me with the basics of theatre tech work basics on both the sound and light boards, the rail which brings scenery and backdrops in and out and general procedures. I took to it all as well as you would probably expect and really enjoyed the job, helping everyone out with random things. It was fun and I got along well with everyone and the schedule was pretty lenient so I was able to prioritise my education. I was super interested in the lighting and didn't click at all with the sound stuff so I did a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one training with Dave on the light board. Sometimes I'd arrive and the two of us would talk about ourselves, philosophy, our hopes and dreams, you name it, for over an hour sometimes before we actually got to any work. But he'd always say stuff like that I was very mature for my age, good head on my shoulders and all that sort of thing. The stuff that, according to my therapist, due to issues with my dad that low-key screwed me up, I subconsciously craved to hear from an adult male. It was nothing creepy at all is what I'm getting at and... I want to stress that. There were no weird vibes from him or Mark who was just quirky but not creepy. I never felt the slightest bit uncomfortable with either of them. So fast forward about a year and a half or so and I think I was 17 by then, almost 18. By now me, Sarah, Dave and Mark had become really close in fact, almost like family close and we all definitely had respect for each other as human beings and we cared no small amount about each other. It was really great and I felt so blessed to work with such wonderful people. One day, we were all at the theatre on the maintenance shift, just cleaning and putting things back, restoring the lighting back to our general plot and all of that sort of thing. But we all exit the back door together, Dave and Mark heading to Dave's car as they live right next to each other and I remember Mark saying something like, see you guys Thursday, totally normal, no red flags. Thursday rolls around and... 
Mark isn't there. We ask Dave what's going on because, well, he's Mark's boss and he's also his best friend, so he should definitely know. And he sort of avoids the question. We notice that too, and the whole day, Dave is acting just really tense, on edge, and is definitely really worried about something. Sarah and I avoid the subject, as Dave clearly doesn't want to talk about whatever's going on, and I don't remember if this went on for a while or just that one shift without Mark, but one day, I'm lounging around at home and get a call from my boss. Now, this wasn't the theatre manager, but the next level up, the boss's boss. Her name was Joy, and... I've known her from since I was a kid too, but since I started working there, she's not exactly in contact with the individual employees, so this was definitely pretty abnormal. What she told me on the phone was shocking and also really confusing. She said that Mark had been fired indefinitely and Dave was on paid leave until she could get more information. She said that Sarah and I will be running the theatre for the summer mostly by ourselves. She tells me that she can't give me any information regarding Mark and Dave and she's really sorry. I immediately call my mum and she isn't surprised when I tell her about Joy's call and sounds almost sad and apprehensive. I ask if she knows what's going on and she says that she does but like Joy, isn't allowed to disclose any information and she's sorry too. Now, my my mum and I are very close so this makes me feel a little betrayed and honestly pretty nervous. When I get to work for the next shift too, the atmosphere is just heavy as anything and Sarah and I, who were close enough, weren't as bonded as we both were with Mark and Dave, but talk amongst ourselves about what's going on and we honestly can't figure it out. We work like this through the entire summer too, totally clueless and while this experience has made us closer, we were both worried about our friends, unable to obtain any information and strongly advised against contacting either of them. By the end of the summer, we settled on a tentative explanation, like perhaps Mark stole some of the theatre's equipment and Dave knew about it or something. But that would explain Mark's immediate termination and less abrupt leave that Dave was put on. We didn't want to believe it, but it was the only thing that seemed to make sense. Finally, after being left in the dark for months, Diana comes into the booth and says that she needs to talk to us about Mark and Dave. And because she and my mum are friends, I'm pretty close with her too, and... The look she gives me when she sees me is one of pity and she's clearly very disturbed. And then she sits down and tells us what happened. At the beginning of summer, the police were aware of somebody in the town downloading child pornography. They tracked down the computer it was downloaded to and it was Mark's computer. After thoroughly examining his hard drives too, they unearthed dozens of videos that seemed to have been filmed in our theatre. The videos were taken from the corner of the catwalks, a a stretch of platform above the front of the stage that holds our front of house lights. To get there, you go up into this alcove room, climb up a ladder to a platform, and then up another ladder. It's so dark up there with the lights out that it's pretty much impossible to see the top clearly when you're in the alcove room on the side of the stage. This means that if no one is looking, someone could potentially stand up there, very still and quiet, and not be noticed at all. Many theatre and dance companies use the alcove for quick changes, when they need to change their costume really quickly in order to get back out on stage fast and wouldn't have time to run all the way back to the dressing rooms and whatnot. And the videos depicted young girls from one of our local return every year dance companies dressing and undressing, though one of them got totally naked apparently. The girls ranged from maybe 10 to 18 and In order to verify any identity so that parents and dance company would be contacted, the police had Diana watch every single one of those videos. At this point, as she was telling Sarah and I the story, she looked visibly sick and I was just in shock and I was nauseous. But she continues. In one of the videos, you can see the arm of a person holding the camera. Diana identified the arm as Dave's due to his distinctive tattoo. And so, what ended up happening is that Mark was automatically fired because, well, downloading child pornography is a felony. However, filming girls dressing and undressing, apparently, while creepy and disturbing, is technically not a felony, so they put Dave on leave, pending more investigation. 
He was eventually also fired, and amidst the child pornography and the videos from the theatre, the police also found many homemade videos involving Dave and his girlfriend, and Mark, doing some allegedly really disgusting stuff. But no one's been willing to elaborate on this, and I'm not exactly sure, and I don't even know if I really want to know. But after hearing all of this, I am definitely not okay. I'm shocked, and... I feel sick and I feel betrayed. I love these men like family, and they honestly had my complete trust. I admired them, I was a child, I couldn't help wondering over and over again in the months to come what the real reason Dave hired me was too. Everyone who knows the story too tells me not to think about it, that it probably really was a favour to my mum, but I was a child, same as those girls, and well, neither did anything creepy to me. I. I can't help getting sick just thinking about if they had thought about it. Now, you may be wondering how these two creeps got hired in the first place, right? For both of them, this was actually their first offence. My company does all the appropriate background checks and all that, but since neither of them had a record of anything, their checks actually came back clean and they were both hired. In the aftermath, Sarah and I stuck together and she was eventually promoted to Dave's position as technical director and production manager and, and I took her position as the lighting technician after a solid stressful crash course and sort of being thrown into it, sink or swim style, since my training had never been prioritised. We hired a few temporary sound guys to keep us going and we now have two fairly permanent sound guys who are both really great. Sarah and I are actually really close now too. I mean, after going through something like that with someone and working together with them to save an entire theatre, you get to be pretty good friends. Our sound guys know the gist of the story too, and give both Sarah and I the respect that we earned through that. I still love the job, and in a strange way, I, I guess Sarah and I kind of benefited from the situation in the end. But Dave and Mark were in court for almost a year, and... Eventually, they both got sentenced with prison time, but now, two and a half or so years later, both of them are out. And not long ago, Diana told us that she actually ran into Dave, pulled up next to him in a gas station parking lot. She apparently froze up and, when she could breathe again, just left immediately. She says that he no longer drives his distinctive old truck, so I have no idea who to look for to avoid. No one has seen Mark though and I'm terrified of running into one of them to be honest. To the point where I don't care to go to my favourite coffee shop in town because I know that they both frequented it. The Megans actually list their address as the same so I just try to avoid that street that they live on at all costs. I honestly don't know what I'd do if I encountered one of them and if I would just get angry or punch one of them, run away from them or just freeze in shock. But I sure do hope that... I never see Dave and Mark ever again. Back when I was a young girl, after a long day at school, I had the usual routine of watching some TV until my friends could play outside. But one day as I was watching TV, I, I grabbed for the remote to change the channel, but it was not where I left it. I was the only one home, so I knew something else must have moved it. And after that, the remote, as well as other objects, just began to relocate on a regular basis. And my parents actually started to blame me. I tried to tell them several times about how the remote was being hidden as if it was some child playing a game with me or something, but they figured that I was just wanting attention. Since our house was known as the Yelling House on our block due to how much my parents fought, my parents figured that this was simply my way of acting out because everyone knew my home life was troubled. This all changed when my dad was watching a movie late one night in the living room by himself. So he had all the lights off in the house and when he reached for the remote in the low light conditions, he found that it had vanished too. Scanning the room, he spotted the remote several feet away from the telephone in the hallway. Annoyed, he stood up to retrieve the remote but then stopped halfway across the room and dropped his drink when he saw the unmistakable shape of a, a woman standing in the kitchen. He immediately called for my mum to get him his bat so that he could remove this intruder from our house. And as all of this was happening in the front of the house, back in my bedroom, I awoke with an uneasy feeling in my body. I began to approach my door to see what was wrong and I heard the distinct sound of a, a woman crying. 
I figured it was my mum crying again after her and my dad had a fight, so I opened the door to investigate, and I remember going to step out of my bedroom when my mum quietly stopped me. I looked up and saw that she hadn't been crying at all. Well, we stood together in the silence as my father, baseball bat in hand, stalked towards this crazy lady who had broken into our house. He walked into the kitchen and then we heard the sound of the bat. But it wasn't the sound of a bat striking anyone. It was the sound of the bat being dropped to the floor. My father emerged from the kitchen moments later, looking extremely pale. Obviously shaken, he mumbled to us something about how the lady had walked through the wall next to the garage and just disappeared. Even though the weeping woman was clear to my father and I, my mum claimed to have never seen a lady. After that first night, the weeping lady would appear to us regularly too. It was always with the same actions as well. She would stand at our sink for a long while, then, crying, she would just walk across the room and vanish into our wall adjacent to the garage. Since the issue with the objects being relocated began around the same time these appearances started, we assumed it was her moving the items and would even scold her for it on occasion. Eventually, we got tired of the cycle the weeping lady held to and we hung a curtain up to cover the entryway into the kitchen to just give us all some privacy. Something interesting to note too is that I remember that she would appear looking very different at times. Most times she wore a black Victorian style dress and would be crying into a piece of cloth clutched into her hand. Other times she wore a white flowing nightgown with a lengthy silk robe, appearing as if she was standing in a gentle breeze or something. When she was dressed in her black clothing, she almost seemed solid and her tears came quietly. While she was in her white clothing, she looked more transparent and her tears were quite loud. Her weeping would be so loud at times, in fact, that neighbors would wonder the following day if my parents had been fighting again. It was the type of crying that would make anyone hearing it just feel the sensation of extreme pain and loss. And, unfortunately, no matter what we tried, she would never acknowledge my presence. To this day, I, I don't know what happened to her, and most people don't believe me when I tell them, but... It would have been great if we had seen some sort of other reaction, but I found that most of the things that lived in that house were unaware of any other paranormal presence aside from their own. Most people would refuse to live in a house like this, but keep in mind, we didn't stay here by choice. My family had very little income, and it wasn't in any way realistic for us to be able to pack up and just move, especially when the reason for the move was it's haunted. Little did I know, though, that my experiences at that house would set the stage for a lifetime of encounters with all sorts of just weird paranormal stuff. I'll stop here for now, though, because this is already getting a bit long. I rent a small house with my partner, and it actually used to be a family cottage in my landlord's family that he converted to a regular rental home. We've lived here for... Uh, about two years, I think now, with our two adult cats, too. And since we moved in, a few minor things have happened. So, it started as a sound or two coming from upstairs when no one else was in the house. The cats were on the couch or downstairs with us, and sometimes it was uh, footsteps, twice it was scratches against the floor, and it happened maybe four or five times. But recently, things have just gotten a little bit worse. So, uh, both of us have actually been touched by something. Uh, my partner and I have both felt something brush our ankles, like uh, an affectionate cat. But both cats were asleep on the bed. Whatever it is, it seems to concentrate on me more than my partner, too. But once, it gently grabbed my elbow. It's brushed up against me on two additional occasions, once in the bedroom and once while I was cooking. But recently, too, I've been experiencing these really weird hallucination kind of things. Kind of like when you're in that pre-sleep stage or just about to head off to sleep. These visions are kind of in a pre-conscious state if you catch my drift. This has never happened to me before, mind you, and I believe that whatever it is has showed its face through these things. It's always pale and it has an unsettling smile and it looks vaguely human, but not quite. Last week, one of the rosaries on my bedpost broke, and yesterday morning, it threw a shoe off the radiator while it was warming. And that was the first time that I've seen something physical like that. 
Then, last night, it jabbed me in the ribs really hard while I was washing dishes. And it growled at me on the stairs going up to the bedroom. This morning, it knocked three times, like knuckles on wood, and it was so loud that it actually woke me up. Now, I've seen and heard things before, and I'm open to knowing what's around me, but I don't communicate with this thing. This thing clearly wants my acknowledgement too, but given its level of perseverance, I'm not inclined to give it what it wants. Also, I was lying awake next to my partner two nights ago, and she kept mumbling in her sleep. At one point, the mumbling stopped, and she just tapped my hand with her finger, and a while later, she was talking in her sleep again, and I couldn't exactly hear what she said. I woke her up, though, and she told me that she was seeing things in her sleep. She said that she tapped me because she couldn't move and felt like she was being held in place. The next morning, she had a, a single small scratch on her abdomen. She doesn't know where it came from, and to be honest, it looks pretty fresh. I don't know what to do, and uh, if you guys have any suggestions, I'm all ears. So there's this house on a corner from where I grew up. This house first came on my radar after my parents had divorced when I was around nine years old. My dad would pick my brother and I up every weekend and drop us off on Sunday nights. And one Sunday night, he made a comment as we passed by the house that every time I drive by that house, it looks exactly the same. I was confused and we had pretty much passed it before I could take a look, but he explained that the curtains are in the same spot, the porch light is always on and nobody is ever in the driveway. That next weekend, we actually drove past the house and for the first time, I saw it. Ordinary looking 90 single story home, the curtains were open on the only front window, porch light was on. So for years as I grew up and my dad took us back to my mum's, I would always check the house to see if there was ever something different. Fast forward to me turning 16 and acquiring a license and it was an amazing time and I drove my car everywhere as first time drivers do and feeling nostalgic, I drove back to our old house where my mum and my brother and I lived. The divorce really impacted me too and I wanted to see our old house where we were once a family. I also wanted to see where my dad picked us up and dropped us off. So I passed the strange house and continued my ritual and I was blown away. After all these years it was still exactly the same. One weekend I gathered my high school buddies and uh, we did some, uh, some toilet paper. I told my friends about the weird house and we went and toilet papered it too. This is the first time that I got to look at it up close too. At first glance through the window you could see a cross on the wall and a dark green sofa and a grandfather clock. But We toilet papered it until a car passed by the main road and then we just split. I went back with one of my friends who toilet papered it with me and the TP was pretty much gone by this point. But the house still looked the same though. No car and no TP. So, someone definitely lives there or the neighbors cleaned it up or something. Fast forward to my 20s and I started dating a girl who I grew up with. On my commute to her place is this house too and it's still exactly the same. So, I pull over and I do something incredibly stupid. I get out of my car and I walk up to the house and ring the doorbell. I figured I could tell them how their house has been a, an ongoing joke with my dad and my friends and I wanted to just clear the air with them. Across the street I hear a door shut and I turn around. The neighbour across the street beelines towards me and meets me at the porch of this strange house and says, can I help you? Confused, I explain to him the story and he seemed to be looking around funny at me and at the house and at his surroundings, as if... He wasn't even really listening to me. He seemed like a, a rough blue collar kind of guy and reeked of booze and he said, well nobody's home. That's literally all he said to me too and then he just walked back to his house or driveway, got in his red pickup and just drove off. At my girlfriend's I, I told her the story of the house and about the guy and even she thought it was pretty odd. 
My girlfriend and I did the deed and I left the place at 3am exhausted and I rolled the windows down and blasted some red hot chili peppers, as one does in their 20s, and I noticed a car behind me and we were entering a residential area so I turned down the music and it's a, a red truck. And my heart skips a beat and I make some weird turns and it was definitely following me. So I jump on the freeway and eventually I... I lose him. I swore never to go anywhere near that house ever again, but I was angry and I had questions. So I gathered my buddy from high school and we stalked the crap out of it for hours and we started Saturday at 3pm and around 9pm that guy in the red truck just walks across the street, unlocks the front door of the strange house, sits on the dark green couch and stared at the window as he seemed to be talking or something. He then disappears into the house, the garage door opens minutes later and he walks out of the house with more people than he walked in with and they get into a car parked on the street and drive away. The neighbor guy then locks up the house and goes across the street and to his house and that was pretty much it. But I had so many questions like was this a halfway house, a brothel, I wasn't sure. The house still looks the same from the looks of Google Images and I still have no closure and it uh, it just really bothers me because it feels strange, like there's something going on in that house. Anyway, there's definitely human trafficking here and this is a state near the border. It's about um, 40 or 50 miles away from the border I'd say. However, I don't feel like this theory carries much weight. The people who walked out with the neighbor were all adult white men and they all seemed pretty geeky, almost dad-like. I'd like to suspect that this was possibly a place for some sort of AA meetings or possibly some sort of group or business being operated out of a home or something. Maybe that's why the neighbor was so unpleasant as he wanted to keep it low-key to possibly avoid legally running a business or something for reasons such as taxes, licenses, regulations and so on. But... The whole place just has this really eerie vibe about it. What are your thoughts? Oh, and uh, P.S. As far as the toilet papering goes, I was a teenager and I think we all do some pretty stupid and pretty awkward things in high school, right? Honesty and integrity is everything and I straightened out my act as I matured and worked as a firefighter, a paramedic and contributed to society. Anyway... I just thought I'd mention that for those who are worried that I might be TPing other places. Thanks for listening. I used to be in foster care and I went to this program that helped foster youth with employment and GEDs and whatnot. I normally took the bus to go to my customer service class but missed it by a few minutes so I decided to walk and I'd done it before with no complications so I didn't think it was a big deal. As I was walking I noticed a young man walking down the street across from me staring at me as he made his way down the sidewalk. He even turned his head to watch me as I passed him so I was feeling a little bit creeped out at this point. Anyway, I I started to walk faster because I was starting to feel really uneasy and the building was about an hour or so away and I thought that he would just continue walking but he actually crossed the street to walk on my side of the sidewalk and started following me. I decided to call my boyfriend at the time so I would have someone on the phone with me but he wasn't able to answer. I kept walking hoping that he would eventually just go away and leave me alone but man, was I wrong. I had to stop at a red light and by this time the man had caught up with me and he forcefully and aggressively grabbed my rear. I don't remember exactly what he said but it was something along the lines of, hey baby girl, how you doing? I felt like I wanted to throw up and I remember getting really angry and spinning around to face him and I said, don't ever touch me again you creep. The light turned green and I basically started jogging away from this weirdo and he just kept following me. I pulled out my phone again to call one of my friends this time and asked her to stay on the phone with me and there was a small tunnel that I had to walk through coming up and this is where I started to feel really scared because I would no longer be visible to the public and I still had this weirdo following me. And after I exited the tunnel, the guy practically ran up behind me and pinned me against the wall, rubbing himself against my butt. 
I remember screaming at the top of my lungs for him to let me go and squirming around like a fish out of water before he finally released me and just threw his hands up in defeat before walking away. My friend was on the phone the whole time this happened and I informed her that I was going to call the police. As they were questioning me, they informed me that they had had the same incident reports from multiple different women describing the same man. He was arrested and I'm not sure if he's out now or not because I moved out of state. So I had been around 9 to 10 years when this happened. In October of 2006, a mother of two kids that I went to school with, she'd gone missing on one of the bike paths that ran through our town. Initially, the police had suspected that it was her husband, but they ended up finding her body a few yards off the bike path and everything was consistent with three murders that had occurred in the 90s on a bike path in a town 15 minutes from mine. But they had arrested a man for those murders without conclusive evidence, but they believed that they got the guy. Anyways, my story happened about three weeks before this woman went missing. So my dad and I were walking on the same bike path that goes through my town, behind our school, and it was only five minutes from my old house. We always came walking up here with our golden retriever named Aspen. Off of this bike path was a hill, and sometimes we would go down it and walk along the woods towards a meadow. So my dad decided that he was going to take my dog down it so she could run down it a few times because she likes doing it and it would give her some uh, some cardio. Anyways, my dad went down the hill and for whatever reason, I decided to just stay up there. So I'm standing there for a few minutes just looking around when a man with a German Shepherd walks up to me. He starts asking me how I'm doing and if this is my favorite bike path and I answer him and I was a little bit hesitant because I had always been taught stranger danger and all that but I didn't want to be rude and he wasn't coming across as too creepy or anything so I thought everything was okay. But while he was talking to me, two women walk by us and he asks if they're my parents. I say no and he asks me if I would like to walk with him and his dog for a bit because he liked talking to me. I started getting pretty nervous about this and I said no obviously and he just kept insisting that I come with him. Finally my 10 year old head was like this is enough and I started screaming bloody murder for my dad and he runs up with my dog while this guy gives my dad a quick look as he's getting to the top of the hill and starts running away with his dog. I'm crying hysterics while my dad is calming me down and calling 911 and uh, one cop who was off duty was near our location and they came to us and had a few guys on the lookout for this guy. But my best description for them other than the dog was that he was a bit taller with a beard and dark features and they never found the guy. Fast forward a few weeks and this woman goes missing. But they end up finding her, get a bunch of DNA evidence, find this guy that lives in a few towns away and match his DNA with the murders from the 90s and yep... It's the same guy. He killed this woman and those other women and he just lived an average life with a wife and kids and everything. No one ever suspected him of doing it and the guy that they had arrested in the 90s was released and given tons of compensation. When they released the guy's face on TV, you can probably guess who it was, right? None other than the creep who tried to take me on that bike path. It made both my dad and I sick when we saw his picture and we still talk about it from time to time to this day. So this happened about five years ago when I was 14 and my sister was 18. My dad is an avid fisherman who loves fishing in the middle of nowhere simply because there aren't any other people around. For this particular fishing trip, he went up to a state park in Georgia a, a couple of hours from where we lived. After about an hour down a mixture of dirt and gravel road, we arrived at a pretty large clearing where we parked. We got out and walked down a hill to a small waterfall with a pool of water at the bottom. But the river before the waterfall was really shallow and the details of the area are kind of important for the story. So... When we arrived, we had lunch by the river and we started fishing. We were there for about an hour when I started to get bored and went back up to the car that was parked nearby for some water. On my way back to my dad, 
I noticed a man standing just behind the tree line of the clearing, about 30 feet from our car. Thinking it was a bit weird, I, I hurried back to my dad and I told him. By the time I told him, we all looked back and the guy was already standing above us on the top of the hill. This man also gave us all just a really weird vibe from the start. He was in his late 20s and stood at about 6 foot. He wasn't an overly broad person, but he was far taller than my dad. He was dressed in a, an army uniform, although it, uh, it honestly looked like a Halloween costume. The most noticeable part about him, though, was the machete that he was holding. My dad, remaining calm, started to strike up a conversation with him and asked if he was fishing here too. But the man just stared at us for about a minute before answering that he was waiting for his friends to come by in a boat so that he could pick them up. And mind you, he had no car with him, no trailer, and he was at the base of a waterfall, which all obviously raised suspicions for us. My dad at this point was obviously very concerned, even though he kept very calm, and while chatting to the guy just about arbitrary things... He was slowly packing up all of our stuff and putting himself between the man and his children. The man didn't actually respond much and just kind of stood there, really twitchy and restless. In about 20 minutes too, my dad managed to move us slowly up the hill and back to our car. When we started making motions to leave, however, the man started getting aggressive. He suddenly started talking about his time in the military and how his high school sweetheart left him for another person. His eyes got really wild after mentioning his ex-girlfriend and he turned his attention to my sister. He started yelling about how women were awful and would always be unworthy of a man's attention, all while leering at my sister and stabbing the ground repeatedly with his machete. At this point, my dad decided that we needed to go and motioned for my sister and I to just get in the car before he followed and locked the doors. We got out of there in a hurry as the guy just watched us leave before going back into the trees. This guy has actually become a bit of a joke in our family as we dubbed him Machete Man, but that experience, it will always stick with me. My dad admits too that that was the one time where he truly wished he had a gun because his only weapon at the time was a pair of measly scissors. Alright, so uh, a little disclaimer first. As a medical professional in the emergency field, I, I get to see a lot of mental illness when treating my patients. All of us do, in fact. And sometimes I, I cannot help but be a, a little bit spooked by what some people say or do. I keep a straight face and treat everyone with the utmost respect, but I still can't help but feel a little creeped out. This happened approximately one year ago. My partner and I respond to a residence for a child, not acting right. Entering this family's home, this approximately seven-year-old boy was sitting on the couch in no obvious distress. He was looking around, acting normally, talking with his family. The boy's mother states that the boy has been seeing and talking to his recently deceased grandfather, and that she would like for him to be taken to the hospital since these happenings are not getting any better. Naturally, I lead the boy and his mother out to the ambulance and we all sit on the back so that I can get a full set of vital signs. But for those interested, all vital signs were normal, including blood sugar and temperature and everything. As I'm taking the boy's vital signs and asking him questions, he takes his eyes off me and looks towards the back windows. All of a sudden, the boy smiles like he sees someone familiar and he waves at whatever it was. The boy says that I was hoping you'd find me here, sit next to me, and he points to me, and I feel the hair on the back of my neck stand straight up. Now, in between what seemed like casual conversation between the boy and this imaginary person, I was asking the boy questions about what was being said. What does your friend look like? What is he saying? And he doesn't answer me. Finally, I ask, can I talk to him? And all conversation stops, and... It just gets really quiet. The boy looks scared now and he says, No, please, just leave him alone. He's just curious. The boy looks over at me and says, No, he doesn't want to talk to you. He says that he hates you. The boy looks back over at the empty seat next to me and nods his head like he was agreeing with what was being said. 
I look over at the boy's mother like, what the heck, and her eyes are huge with fear. Finally, the boy says, Grandpa, why do your eyes glow like that? Oh, okay, bye, see you later. The ambulance started its transport to the hospital at that time, and the boy looked back over at me and didn't say one more thing to the invisible person. And it was like all normal conversation from here on out. When asked about his imaginary friend too, he just said that, oh, it's just my grandpa, and he said that he couldn't go any further. Kids say the darndest things, hey? Back in the day, I worked long shifts in which we would rotate through different dorm rooms every day if needed. Some days we were able to sleep, and some days there would be no sleep at all. During this event, I had not been able to sleep for at least two days in a row, and finally, after a long day, I made my way up the stairs to the dorm room. There were five dorm rooms in the area, all complete with a twin bed, bedside table, and closet. The closest four were always used before the last one located way in the back of the old building. Unfortunately for me, I was staff member number five that night, and also the last one person to get a room. I entered the room though and closed the door and hopped on the creaky old bed and sleep happened immediately. All of a sudden though, I, I woke up in the middle of the night at some stage. I was completely paralyzed to the point of almost not being able to breathe. My head was facing towards the old wooden door entering the room and the door started to creak open very slowly. A tall dark white figure entered the room and the figure appeared to have some sort of a, a big black cloak. A hood was covering its head too and it moved to the corner of the room and started resonating a, a slow low toned chuckle. In the darkness I could see that it was bearing a wide white smile and, and then it said finally someone knew and it started coming toward me continuing to chuckle and I could feel it lay on top of me making it even more difficult to breathe. It felt so heavy and cold on top of me and I could even feel the sharp black fabric on the back of my neck and arms. My heart was racing so fast at this point and finally after what felt like forever, it got off the top of me and stood back up and it walked back through the open door whispering, come back soon, ultimately disappearing from sight. I woke up that morning thinking that was the most messed up and realistic dream that I've ever had in my life. I looked up towards the door and I realized something. The door, it was open. Rationalizing it with myself, I, I assumed that uh, maybe somebody opened it last night by accident or something. I walked downstairs and I just made myself some coffee. One of the other employees made their way into the kitchen and sat down at the table and I told her about my crazy nightmare or sleep paralysis episode or whatever the heck it was and as I progressed through my story, the look on her face became just more and more concerned. Finally, when I finished my story, she explained to me that the same exact thing happened to her in the same room a month prior. She described the dark figure perfectly from the black cloak with the hood to the wide white Cheshire-ish smile. Finally, uh, another older employee entered the kitchen and he had overheard some of the conversation prior and he filled up a cup of coffee and sat down at the table and he said, so you found out why nobody sleeps in the old room. We've all made that mistake once. This happened around four or five years ago and it still gives me the creeps when I think about it and I give you my word that it's true. So I was on my way home from the football in the city with a couple of friends and our night finished up and we hopped on the train back to the burbs. I saw off my buddies as they all live on stops before me and I'm the last along the line in our group and my house is in between stations and it's pretty much directly in the middle so it's a reasonable 20 minute walk home either way. This night I decided to walk home along the beachside nature track and it's like a, a 50 to 100 meter wide, couple of kilometers long, untouched nature reserve that runs parallel to the train tracks. And I did it to get a bit of a nature fix, even though it was a bit of a windy night. So I'm a couple of hundred meters in and 
I'm suddenly aware that I can hear masses of what just sounded like loud conversations swirling around me. A lot like being in a crowded room and hearing a lot but not being able to pick up on anything, if you know what I mean. But the problem is, is that there was absolutely no one around and it's about one in the morning so I stop in my tracks and stand still to focus and strain my ears and I look up at the sky and as I'm watching the trees sway heavily in front of me and I'm focused hard and notice that the conversation seems to be amongst the trees and it's getting louder too. As soon as I come to this realization, the wind stops and the trees just come to a complete still halt. Well, the hairs on the back of my neck come up at the unnatural stillness as I make out a high voice amongst the trees through the silence and they say, hey, this one can hear us. Well, after that, I had had enough and I bolted home without my feet touching the ground. I take the roadway home these days and on a side note, unrelated or not, this part of the train line between stations is known as the suicide bend of our line and there's been so many that uh, I've honestly lost count. A side note too is that uh, I'm still unsure if uh, these things or energies or whatever the heck it was are related to the activity that I've experienced in my house for years now. So two days ago, I was with my friends at a party, everything was going well, and it was a bit boring for me because I can't actually drink, I have stomach problems, but nevertheless we had some fun, left the party early, and went to a friend's house to chill. After a couple of minutes, I heard some of his friends came in to join us. Several hours passed, and because it was getting very late, I actually wanted to leave to go home, and some friends of his decided to take me home in the car, and before we reached the car, we saw several men out in front of the car, many who obviously looked drunk, but I wasn't expecting any kind of trouble, so as I walked past the car to get to the back seat, waiting for the owner to let me in, a, a man approached me from that group and told him to get inside the house because he was needed by someone. It appeared to me that the owner knew this guy because he did exactly that without opening the car or telling me anything. I just kind of stood there for a couple of seconds and then decided to walk back into the house to see if he's still willing to take me home or if I should just go home on my own. I actually had my driver's license suspended due to an accident a few years ago. So I went into the house and couldn't see the owner anywhere and said goodbye again to some friends while I was thinking of my journey home because the public transport at that hour doesn't really work. It was about 4am I think. I live in Eastern Europe by the way and I don't know if in the US the public transport system differs. But in that same time a, a man that was outside apparently walks in the house with two more guys and it actually catches my attention this time. He had medium brown darkish hair, slim with loose clothes, very common looking. That wasn't the thing that caught my attention. But when he entered the house, I, I just had this strong feeling coming from him that I just can't describe that well. He looked at me and he had dark brown glossy eyes and didn't say anything, but then he started moving around and like nobody was noticing him. Even the two boys that went with him and that's when I realized that his movements were just so unnatural or weird. The feeling that I had was not fear though, like you'd be scared of the unknown, like ghosts or demons or the dark or a horror movie or something, but this was a feeling that I had a few times when someone died or saw something really graphic and gore related. Kind of like a really dark disgust and my brain just rewired in a way like I suffered a, a real psychological trauma or something. Anyway, he looked at me intensely, which at the time seemed uh, like a really long period, and I just couldn't move. I now remember opening my mouth halfway and just kind of staring back at him, eyes wide open and fixated my vision at him, but didn't want to make eye contact with his eyes. Subconsciously, for some weird reason, I, I think I told myself not to look, and he never spoke a word, and nobody else ever acknowledged him. He just went straight for the door after making those rounds in the house and for a second he just stood under the door entrance and turned his head again to look at me. And he was completely pale white and in a way that just kind of evoked the same feeling in me as before. And then he just left. 
I tried to gather myself and tell myself that there was nothing wrong and that the person was just someone my friend knew and just came into the house and it was just kind of coincidental that nobody noticed him. I honestly forgot about the whole thing while I was outside walking in the freezing snow, feeling sleepy and tired until I saw him again near a closed travel agency building and he was ahead of me, leaning against the glass walls. But he didn't seem to notice me, but I knew then that it was definitely him. I switched sides on the sidewalk to get some distance and with one eye looking over in his direction. He noticed me halfway and kind of smiled shortly and... I couldn't see his face better because of the snow and the distance, but I noticed his mouth was a a deep red, almost bloody, and after I saw that, I, I picked up the pace, worrying that he might follow, but he just stood there, and shortly after, I was out of range and I was on my way home. Now, I tend to smoke a lot, and I had this irrational fear when I got home, and I lit up some cigarettes with my window open and I thought that someone might come in and I was thinking of him specifically, though I I do live in an apartment on the 15th floor. Nothing happened of course and eventually I, I went to sleep and that was it. To this day though, I remember vividly the same feelings I had when I encountered this man and I just can't shake it up. I know that this is going to sound a little bit crazy but... I guess the only one word that comes to mind when I think of him is a a sort of vampire. Though, strangely enough, it's not from any book or fiction or myth that I know of. But that's honestly kind of what he looked like. I could tell myself that this is nothing out of the ordinary, but the experience that I went through was anything but ordinary. It's kind of hard to explain why this whole situation was so odd, but... The fact that he walked around the house and everyone just kind of ignored him and no one even saw him was just weird. And then walking past him and him having all this blood on his mouth? I can't ignore that and subconsciously I've given it all credence. Okay, so first of all I... I don't want this to seem like a story in search of sympathy or anything, but more of a way to finally accept it and move on and hopefully help other people realize the red flags in a relationship that I so blindly overlooked. I'm uh, I'm sorry this is a little long too, but please bear with me as it's worth the listen. So, some background information to begin with. I'm 18 years old and I met this boy Trent. Trent and I met through a mutual friendship group of friends that I was very close with for many years. We started hanging out as a group to smoke and sesh with our friends and he was honestly the loveliest boy with such kind eyes and the most adorable smile and I was infatuated. Trent had a past before I knew him, troubles with past girlfriends and a bit known for a bad temper but I ignored the warnings from multiple people and even an ex of his, assuming the classic lie that he'll never hurt me though. We started dating late March last year, the 21st to be exact, and he asked me out on a night when he had taken a lot of Xanax for fun with his friends and was expressing to me and his friends within two months of knowing him how he was completely head over heels for me and that just made me fall deeper and deeper. Everything was just so exciting and new and he honestly gave me butterflies. Side note to this too is that I had been diagnosed with severe anxiety disorder and bipolar 2 disorder which just adds to the fun of my life, right? Anyway, all was good until about 4 months of being together and I was home one night, planning to push through it and go out for some drinks with him and some friends but changed my mind as I just physically could not leave my bed. That night he disappeared, his phone off for hours and uh, honestly, me worried sick. In the morning, I wake up to a message saying that his phone had gotten broken when he got pushed into the pool and he had to leave it to sit and write overnight. He came over to my house that day and took care of me while I was sick. Two months go by and I find out three days before my birthday that on that exact night, he had cheated on me after he enticed his ex-girlfriend to go over to his house, saying that he was going to take his own life because we had a fight and I wouldn't speak to him anymore. They did it obviously and when I found out it just broke me. 
and my heart ached and raced and pounded in my chest and I left his house in tears with him chasing me up the street after me and I hid in a driveway and turned off my tracking location that he set up on my phone and caught the first bus that I saw after hiding and watching him pace around the streets, shirtless and shoeless while searching for me. An hour later I decided to answer his call, call number 23 or so and just tell him to leave me alone and... It was then that he screamed and cried and begged, but I didn't give in and so I just ended the call. Two minutes later, he called me saying that he needed to go to hospital as he shattered his hand while punching a hole in a glass mirror behind his door. After a few weeks of my heart longing for him and him begging for me, I, I felt like he must have just really loved me to do all this and it was the stupidest mistake I ever made, but we got back together. His behavior continued throughout our six-month relationship too, and if I didn't answer a phone call, I'd receive ten, within five minutes, messages of how I was a dog and a bitch and just terrible stuff like that. This occurred too, even if I had just left my phone in my room for twenty minutes while I had dinner or something. He demanded to see me all the time and begged to be by my side every minute. I saw all of this as a, an expression of his love to me, I know, it makes me sick too. Our relationship was spent majorly just smoking daily and, I mean, all day. And if I wasn't stoned, all hell would break loose until he could get high again. I spent hundreds of dollars just buying all sorts of stuff to help him feel better when we'd argue in the car or he'd be in a bad mood. He had made threats to me too and my friends in the past about killing all of our dogs and my friends didn't see it the way that I did and eventually we had our falling outs and he assured me that they weren't my real friends anyway. He was the only person that I had in my life who truly cared and loved me and I stupidly believed that. Obviously my confidence diminished, my happiness was released in the smallest doses and I began to stop recognizing the girl who I was and couldn't remember how it felt to really feel genuine happiness. Only when he was in a good mood and wanted to be intimate and cuddly and that's the only time I ever felt good. On our six month anniversary, we had a lovely dinner in the city and at a super expensive restaurant and after our meal and a few drinks, he told me to go wait around the corner for him to pay while I called a cab. I found out when we walked out that... He hadn't paid and we just made a run for it. Later that night we went to visit our two best friends who were also a couple and were our smoking squad as we like to call ourselves and we decided to go for a little drive. My sober friend was driving just around the corner and smoke a little before going to bed. It was while we were chopping up that me and my friend Bella were whispering in the back. But Trent couldn't quite understand what we were talking about and demanded to know what we were saying. And as a joke, Bella sarcastically replied that I was talking about another boy. And this is when he ran around to her side of the car. And as he did this, I pulled the lock on her door and he punched a hole straight through a window, leaving shatters of glass just flying all over him. The police came for a noise complaint and after coming up with an excuse, I was left to walk my boyfriend home while he was sobbing and apologizing and eventually we were escorted home in the police car. We broke up that weekend after encounters of him smashing his head into a wall, swiping a photo frame off the table and slicing his hand, punching a hole in my brother's car window screen and grabbed my shirt while I was driving and I had officially been scared enough and saw for the first time that he might actually be really dangerous. I told him that I just couldn't be with him after the damage to my brother's car and my family would never look at him the same and would ban me from seeing him. The very next morning, he made me pick him up though at 8am and he took the car to get the window fixed so I wouldn't leave him. In short words, I, I didn't forgive him. A week later, a, a week of hundreds of missed calls, thousands of messages of every single social media possible. He began sending me photos of bottles of Xanax that he was buying, telling me that he was going to eat them all and that it was going to be all my fault. My heart honestly sank and I answered his call and begged him not to be so silly. I told him that I would go to see him that afternoon to make sure he was okay but not get back together. He honestly seemed happy about that and hung up on the phone. 
That day I was with a couple of girlfriends at a pool party with some of my old friends that he didn't particularly like and after being there for maybe an hour or so, I bet you can guess who just lets themselves in and walks straight inside demanding to everyone that I leave right now. I obviously refused because I was petrified and his eyes, I knew that look, the way his green eyes just turned almost black when he was enraged. I continued to refuse and told him that I would come outside and talk to him if he let me bring one of the boys outside to make sure I was okay. And he did not take to that one bit and decided to just leave. Okay, so that was kind of a relief for me, right? Well, less than 20 seconds later, we hear smashing in the side street and the whole house ran out to investigate and watched as just Trent ran back to his car and sped off after ripping off the windscreen wipers of another one of my best friend's cars and shattering each window. At this point, we were all just worried and angry and confused, so we decided that we should just drop the damaged car to my house so it was off the streets at least and somewhere safe. However, my car was parked a few streets over and I got into the car and began driving when I was rammed into an intersection. My car was spinning and I quickly gained control only to realize that he was chasing behind me in his own car. We zoomed through the traffic, through red lights, intersections, squeezing through almost impossible car spaces in a movie-like pursuit and I almost hit three pedestrians and god knows how many cars. He chased me down the streets continuously ramming me and then slowing down and speeding up just to ram me again. Glancing back into my rearview mirror, I saw him laughing and taunting me too. And those eyes, I'll never forget them. Immediately when I noticed that it was him chasing me, I called triple zero, Australia's 911, and tried frantically explaining to the operator where I was and what was happening whilst being rammed and trying to dodge cars and people and sidewalks and poles and street signs. I actually thought I'd try throwing him off and turn into a car park that was right there, but he was too quick and sped in front of my car locking me in while he blocked the exit with his car. The door opened and he stepped outside, throwing himself at the windows and trying to rip open the doors. I screamed into the phone and begged for help, but they just could not seem to find me. And eventually, I decided that the windows were going to give out soon and I just needed to get out of here. And so I drove up the gutter, ripping off half of the front bonnet of the car and sped all the way back up the street. I thought that I got away when I saw that he was struggling to get back into his car, but... That relief shattered when I saw his white car right behind me again, ramming and stopping and ramming and stopping while just laughing at me. I drove up to three suburbs and drove straight to my dad's house after a little while and I honked the horn like a crazy person but his car was quick to catch up and I just couldn't bear the thought of putting anyone in my family at risk of this maniac so I just kept going, hoping that he wasn't quick enough to swipe my car off the cliff edge that runs along that street. I continued driving and I even drived over the top of all the roundabouts but I didn't care at the time. My mother lives around the corner from my dad's and I started to head there but as I reached the street I remembered my five year old sister and my mum and I just couldn't dare to put them at risk. And so I, I just kept driving again around corners swiping into cars and trying to find every main road possible begging for help to the operator and for them to just please find me and continued to fly down the street at 120 k's and I mean I was just an 18 year old girl and I've never driven so fast or so chaotically. After about 10 minutes of what seemed like an hour though I, I reached yet another main road and repeated my location to the operator all the while being rammed and tormented. He sped up in the lane next to me in the opposite side of the road and swerved his car in front of mine in an attempt to lock me in so that he could try to rip me out of my car. My immediate reaction was to reverse so I put the car into R and put the accelerator flat to the floor. It only took seconds for him to get back into his car however and he began driving at me head on this time and the only thing that I could do was drive forwards at him. And this is the part where everything just went into slow motion. I saw him coming at me and we were driving at each other at about 40 k's and my only options were to either crash into a parked car next to me, crash head on into Trent, or crash into a telegraph pole on the other side of the road and the only thing running through my mind was which way would be the quickest and least painful to die. And so I, I chose the pole 
and I took a hard right turn as I missed the front of it by being saved by the gutter, saving my life by just me inches. And this, this made him really mad. He turned the car back around, T-boned the driver's side door, pinning me in, and he got out and yet again punched and kicked and slammed all the windows. Now, let me tell you as well that this guy was at least 100 kilos and 6 foot something, and he was massive and I just stood no chance. I began to hop from seat to seat, just trying to stay as far away from whichever window broke first as possible. And the whole chase, it lasted about 17 minutes. And this is when the sirens began to ring and I just broke down and cried as he ran back into his car and took off up the street. He jumped five fences before they managed to tackle him and he spent a weekend in a holding cell and was actually released on bail. My heart ached and my head spun and my mental illness had reached an all-time low and without him I was honestly just ready to end it. The whole situation just made me want to stop existing, but for some strange reason I still loved him. It made me sick, but I honestly loved him. He was handed a restraining order, but that didn't stop him, and the day of his release, he just began apologizing, begging, crying, saying that he had no memory, and he was so sorry, and that he'd never do that again. And this is the part that you're all going to hate on me for. But I actually wanted to take him back. I told him that I still loved him, and I still spoke to him daily, and... He told me that he wouldn't have done those things if I didn't make him so angry and I apologize sincerely, but the jealousy and protectiveness, it continued. There were more threats like, shouldn't have called the cops and just let me kill you, I'm going to kill everyone close to you, I hope you die tomorrow and I'll laugh and honestly just the list goes on and it took me about two months to wake up and realize what the hell I was doing. And it was after he bashed a boy that I actually kissed and started doing drive-bys at a place that I'd hang out at, just staring at me that enough was enough. The saddest part, though, is that when I asked him if he had broken off the windows and gotten into the car that day or somehow had gotten to me, what he would have actually done, he replied with, I honestly don't know. So, if you guys ever feel mistreated, make sure you speak up. If you notice red flags, don't ignore them like I did. A leopard never changes his spots, and if I had stayed with him, I honestly know that I wouldn't be here today to tell you the horror story that was my first relationship. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys, and uh, make sure to stay safe out there. I was 10 years old when we moved to a new apartment. It was in a bad neighborhood, but my mum, who was 8 months pregnant at the time, had no choice in the matter. You see, we had just been released from a domestic violence shelter and turning down a cheap house just wasn't an option, no matter if it was in the ghetto or not. And our first and last day of living there follows. So... After we were dropped off, we claimed our bedrooms, even though we had nothing but a few garbage bags of clothes. Not a single piece of furniture or even a bed was in there, and I claimed the upstairs because it was a cool idea to have two floors. I also imagined running down the stairs to catch the school bus, and my eight-year-old brother chose the room next to mine. My five-year-old sister was sharing a room with our mum downstairs, and it was right beside the front door. After our excitement wore down, we had to walk to the grocery store since we didn't have any food either, and while I was reading the magazines, I casually saw a cell phone that had been left on the racks. At the time, 2001, a few people had them, and definitely not people like us. So I picked it up, and I found my mum, and I showed her with my face shocked. She immediately put it in her purse, and I kind of became angry at her, because I knew that this wasn't the right thing to do. We should tell the manager of the store or wait by the magazines and see if someone comes back to find it. But nope. Mum told me to be hush and just continued to shop. She wasn't a thief or anything. I never saw her steal anything before then and I was still a little mad at her when we arrived back at our new home but we all obviously started taking turns with the phone playing the classic game Snake. When it came time to sleep, we literally piled all of our clothes in my mum's floor. It was the only thing that we could use for a bed and us kids were goofing around on our pallet and mum was in the living room and that's 
when we heard banging on the door. Someone was screaming to let them in the house, a male voice, an unknown voice, banging and kicking the door, and he screamed, let me in or I'll kill you. Mum grabbed the phone and immediately called 911, and after she told them the address and the information, she urgently said before hanging up, hurry or we're about to die. She ran us to the bedroom and told us to hide in the closet and she slammed the door behind her. Of course, me being 10, I immediately opened it back up to peep through to see what was about to happen. I didn't see my mum anywhere and the kicking and the banging just kept getting faster and louder and he was shouting, I know someone's in there, open up this door. Mum came out of the bathroom holding the toilet tank lid over her head and she stood by the entrance of the door waiting for him to eventually break in. Her face was frozen in the most serious expression and she was focused, holding this object almost like a tennis racket. She honestly didn't move at all and she was ready to do something that she probably never imagined she'd do. Attack a, a complete stranger and maybe even kill him. She never said a word back to him or to us and I saw their lights before I heard them. The man was still cursing while the police subdued him and he sounded different though. Disappointed, defeated. The cops then opened up our door and I think that he had just finished breaking it enough to come inside. My mum was still holding the tank lid in her warrior tennis stance and the cop calmly took it away from my mum and said, it's okay, we got him. But within two seconds, she bursted into tears and fell to her knees crying and thanking them and after we all hugged and calmed down a little bit, a cop who offered to stay in patrol until sunrise told my mum something in confidence. She actually shared with me years later that the stranger was a registered sex offender with previous burglary charges as well. The next morning we got picked up by a family friend and we ended up staying with her until we found a safer place to live and that was right before my mum gave birth to my brother. I don't know why he picked our apartment or why he tried so hard to get in but I'm really glad that my mum ended up stealing that phone. It was turned off the next day but we still used it occasionally to play snake. This happened years ago when I was 19 and I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of just how creeped out I was. Back then I was living 600 plus miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mum and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week and we were still really close. So, when we found out that her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive and I had a 10 year old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up but still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself but my mind was made up. So they offered me a deal and I would stop at a rest stop every two hours and stretch my legs and call them and in exchange for this courtesy they would pay for my gas. And if I didn't call within the three hour window though they would assume that I'd been in an accident and call me repeatedly interrupting the audiobook or podcast that they knew that I would have on. And so I accepted the deal. And that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45am. Now, this was actually one of those, uh, those nicer stops. Well lit, multiple vending machines that didn't have those huge cages around them, the payphone wasn't broken and it looked really clean. There were a couple of cars there with people just sleeping in them and I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. He said, Miss, can I ask you a favour? I turned around and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I mean, I didn't see him when I parked, but there he was, uncomfortably close to me. He looked like he was in his 40s, I'd guess. He didn't look dirty or twitchy and he was too close, but his body language didn't scream threatening or anything. And even though I was 19 years old, barely over 5 feet, and at that point in my life 110 pounds soaking wet... And even though I had already binged a lot of true crime media and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night with an out-of-state license plate, my dumbass asked what he needs. 
He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck and if he could just borrow my phone real quick to call his friend. It would just take a second and it would really help him out. And I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him with a no problem and then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit and this guy looked really normal. Except for his eyes. He had these dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's a... The kind of Ted Bundy or Dick Cheney, actress in a Glade commercial who was trying to convince us that she's in love with a dumbass who doesn't know how air freshener works eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and just staring way too hard. I got that that feeling, that runaway feeling, and I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help. And so I put on my best customer service smile and told him, Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry but I don't have a charger and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone. And I need that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now, but good luck. And I turned and walked about 20 feet away and he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning up against my car, just watching me. And at this point... I really didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car because he creeped me out and he had that kind of serial killer face. So going to the bathroom was out too, but I also wanted to get away from him, prove that I'm not going to help him and maybe he'll leave. And I could technically get into the car, but I would have to get really close to him unless I crawled over my passenger side seat and he was definitely not moving. So I did the first thing that popped to mind. I called my dad, and my dad, for the first time that night, he actually didn't pick up the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I I glanced back, and the guy still hadn't moved. He's still just staring at me. So I faked a phone conversation with my dad, and I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I had hung up the phone and loudly said that I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality, I was still at least four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple of visibility security cameras. But the guy, he still hadn't moved and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation at this point. In the years since, I've thought of a lot of things that I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out and my mind just went blank. So I hung up and... I didn't know what to do. I had hoped the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still leaning up against my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes and I bought some cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a little, stretching, and at this point, he's been leaning up against my car for at least 10 minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the men sleeping in their parked cars and asking for help, and Just the thought of having to wake someone up to help me into my own fucking car annoyed me enough that I stopped stalling and I just headed back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm just going to pretend that he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my car door before he started talking to me again and he told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here unless he can call his friend to bring the spare keys. He's not angry or begging, mind you, and... His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but but he'd been creepily watching me for just way too long while blocking my exit, so I wasn't falling for it. I almost pointed out the working payphone just in case I was wrong about this, and I was being a bitch to a guy who actually needs help, but then he leaned forward as I was getting in, and I lost all nerve and slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse, and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on, I was just so focused on getting away from him. And then, halfway out of the rest stop, my mum finally called me. My mum who would freak out if I don't pick up and who was actually really sick and I needed to put on my seatbelt and I could still see him in the mirror and he was standing right next to where I was parked with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone but I kept my engine running and I just kept watching him. I obviously don't want to worry my mum, so I told her everything was fine, where I am and my ETA and all that. 
and now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like maybe I had overreacted. She scolds me about speeding or something, and I tune her out because the guy is moving now. And as my mum is lecturing me about road safety, I watch the guy cross to a truck, unlock the door, and get in. The keys being locked in this truck no longer seem to be an issue for him, and I watch the truck head back out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine to not upset my mum, and I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes, and when I did, I did speed because I didn't want to see that truck. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking and girls who look like they don't live nearby or maybe look like they're living out of their cars, they tend to be targets. I don't know if that was what was happening or if he was just trying to scare me into handing over my phone or something, but either way, it was a bit of a scary night.